Welcome, everybody. Um, today, all eyes are on Washington, D.C., all eyes are on the United States. It's Inauguration Day. Um, it's the day when Joe Biden will be sworn um, into office. Welcome to our inauguration event. Um, I'm Stormy Annika Miltner. I'm with the Aspen Institute, and I will lead you through our event today. So this is the 10th and final um, event of our Road to Election and Beyond series. Um, and it's been an outstanding cooperation with 13 partners who are very committed to the transatlantic relationship and who um, want to send a strong signal to transatlantic of for transatlantic solidarity. So thanks to all our partners who have been involved so far and who are with us at least virtually today um, again. Thanks to the Aspen Institute, to the American Academy in Berlin. Thank you to the American Chamber of Commerce um, in Germany. Thank you to the Atlantic Brücke, the American Council on Germany, Deutsche Atlantische Gesellschaft, Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, Friedrich Naumann Stiftung für die Freiheit, die Hans Seidel Stiftung. Thank you to Heinrich Böll Stiftung, das Amerika Haus NAW, Amerika Haus München, and the German Marshall Fund. Thank you to all of us to travel who have traveled this road together until today to this very day. Um, hello to all uh, of you who have joined us virtually to our guests. And um, please follow us and ask us our questions. We want to make this interactive. So use Twitter and uh, use our hashtag, hashtag R2EN. Um, so this is our old road to election hash hashtag. Um, and many of you um, already know this. So this event series would also not have been possible without the support um, of the house in which we are currently today. Um, the Landesvertretung Baden-Württemberg uh, state representation um, in Berlin. Thank you very, very much for allowing us, uh, having reported from this very premise um, on election night. Um, and thank you so much for having us today. Um, we appreciate this, especially because we know that it's really hard to do events like this during the corona pandemic. So thank you so much um, letting us be here um, in person, live with all the safety um, which is necessary during these hard times. Um, so it is a very great honor um, to hand over to, uh, well, first welcome and then hand over to uh, the state representative, Dr. Andreas Baumann, who will also welcome us virtually. Thank you so much again for having us. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, dear Dr. Miltner. Thank you very much um, for your introduction. Dear viewers from the transatlantic community, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to extend a warm welcome to you and to all to all the participants and listeners at the Landesvertretung Baden-Württemberg. We are very pleased to have the Aspen Institute as our guest once again on this special day. Thank you for the great cooperation in the past several years. Today ends a difficult time for the United States of America and for the transatlantic relations. Today, the new president of the United States will give his inauguration speech and we will listen to Joe Biden's address to analyze in two panels. In the past few years, we almost got used to Donald Trump's daily strange tweets and fatal decisions. We all still reeling from the shock of the storming of the Capitol on January 6th, when supporters of Donald Trump attempted to prevent the formal certification of the results of the pre presidential election. This riot and violent attack will be remembered for a long time. Here in Germany, we are facing similar problems when in August 2020, demonstrators against the state's corona policy broke through a barrier and tried to storm Reichstag building in Berlin. So it would be too easy and even dangerous to think this is an USA problem. Those developments can be observed in all over the world, also here in Europe, even not yet to this extent. Here, two democratic institutions and processes are being questioned and the society is split. The sometimes harsh but unavoidable interventions due to the corona pandemic are 
intensifying these problems. Conspiracy theorists, as well as right-wing extremists, Reichsbürger and other enemies of democracy are searching supporters, mainly by your social media and messenger services. Therefore, Europe and Germany should perceive the escalation of violence in Washington and see it was a warning signal to resist the beginnings. beginnings. In the USA, the new president must now bring peace back to his country, politically and economically. In a four-point agenda for his presidency, Joe Biden has announced the reconciliation of the nation, the containment of the pandemic, the creation of jobs, and the fight against climate change as the main goals. The US is a strong democracy, and I hope for all Americans that this will be proved again now. Of course, we would like to see the transatlantic partner in Washington who together with the EU will follow the path of the multilateral politics. This is important for our economy, but of course for the US, US and world economy, which needs clear legal relationships and no trade barriers. The US aim is although the most important international trading partner for Baden-Württemberg and an important location for our companies. Baden-Württemberg is home to almost 280 American companies. Companies like IBM, Hewlett Packard or John Deere shape the economy in Baden-Württemberg, just as Bosch, ZF, Trumpf and SAP shape the economy in the USA. We need the USA to rejoin in the fight against climate change and as a partner in the International Climate Agreement. And there are many in the USA who are very committed to climate protection. I'm very grateful to former Governor Jerry Brown and my Prime Minister Winfried Kretschmann, who founded the Under Two Coalition, a re regional coalition for climate protection. In this coalition, several US federal states have continued to work on the climate goals even during Trump presidency. Today, more than 220 regions are members of the Under Two Coalition, which makes up a third of the world economy. California and Baden-Württemberg are among the econ economically strongest regions in the world. Those regions show that climate protection and good economic development are two sides of the same coin. I am very pleased that Joe Biden announced to rejoin the Paris Climate Agreement. Now we look forward to a competition regarding the best climate protection concepts, concepts and the best sustainability technologies. This announcement gives us hope that one of the key players in the fight against climate change would become a strong ally again. Ladies and gentlemen, the expectations of the new president have seldom been as high as they have been for Joe Biden. This inauguration marks a turn, turning point after four years of conflict in the transatlantic relationship. But nobody in Brussels, in, in the capitals, capitals of the EU, member states, is naive enough to believe that European-US relations can simply be rolled back to pre-Trump times. One thing is clear. Transatlantic cooperation cannot be taken for granted. The European Commission under President Ursula von der Leyen as well as Council President Charles Michel have prepared discussion papers entitled New EU-US Agenda for Global Change and Renewing EU-US Relations. Now, however, action must follow for joint trade, digitalization, climate protection, security and space. Biden signals are very optimistic. Whether closer cooperation actually works depends on Europe and therefore also on Germany. After four years of Donald Trump, the new president must first of all focus on political and economic issues. The EU should quickly take the initiative for a new cooperation 
we should find answers to a whole range of questions in order to continue to be a central actor in international politics. Russia pursues a sometimes aggressive power politics directly on our borders. The civil wars in Syria and Libya are still unsolved. China is expanding militarily and economically, investing in European infrastructure and trying to drive a wedge between EU member states and the USA. Together with the United States, we must find instruments and ways to deal with both without slamming the door for reliable cooperation. This requires more cohesion and better coordination between Europe and the Western Alliance. The Euro European capitals, Brussels and Washington, need to work more closely together and present a common front in more areas. From climate protection and respect for more human rights, rights to data protection, digitization and the fight against pandemics, we have to coordinate and develop joint solutions. Last but not least, the resumption of the TTIP negotiations and the overdue conclusion of a transatlantic trade agreement would send a clear signal, especially against the background of the world's largest free trade area initiated by China with the 14 Asia countries. The world needs a reliable, capable Western alliance to ensure peace and freedom, security and prosperity. American and European interests may be different, but there's no difference in our common values and political culture. Dear guests, I look forward to your discussions before and after the inauguration speech of the new president of the United States of America and wish us all an interesting and an enlightening evening. I will now return the floor to Dr. Mildner. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you so much um, for this very, very strong call for strong transatlantic relationship and also this enthusiasm. I think it sets uh, the stage very well um, for the day we have today. Um, and um, to get us even more into the mood, um, we now would like to show uh, you a, an interview with a true transatlanticist, uh, which we recorded yesterday, um, with Catherine Kluver Eschbrook. And um, the interview was conducted by Laura Senfle from the Espen Institute, with whom, without whom, we wouldn't be here today either because she took care of all the technical surroundings here. So um, let's see Laura and let's see Catherine. Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome to our Transatlantic Live from all around Europe and the United States, hopefully. My name is Laura Zinfleben, and I am a program officer with the Aspen Institute Germany in Berlin. And I'm thrilled to welcome Katrin Kluver Ashbrook, Catherine, for a pre assessment of Joe Biden's inaugural address. Catherine is a German and American national. She has had a long standing career as a journalist and a civil servant, and she is now the founding executive director of the Future Diplomacy Project as well as the executive director of the project on Europe and the transatlantic relationship at the Harvard Kennedy School in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where she's tuning in from where she is tuning in from today. Catherine, we're honored to have you. Welcome. I'm thrilled to be with my friends at Aspen, and uh, I wish I could cut myself in half so I could be with you in Berlin uh, and in Washington and in Cambridge all at the same time. But I'm glad we are connected virtually today. Well, thank you so much for being here. Catherine, let's dive right into our first question. Um, we're looking at a somewhat unprecedented presidential transition phase, and it feels like the whole world is watching what is happening in the United States, not only today, but has been watching for the past several weeks and months. Why do you think it is important for us Germans and Europeans um, to follow this year's inauguration process so closely? Well, I think what we're expecting in Europe and frankly, what most of the country is expecting is a real break with the last four dark years of Donald Trump. If you think about the inauguration four years ago, the president ended his remarks by warning of American carnage. It was certainly in my lived history of American democracy, the darkest inauguration speech we have ever heard. And, you know, here we are four years on in the midst of American carnage, carnage 
that this president brought on the United States uh, in his poor handling of the pandemic uh, and the associated crisis in the American economy, in the way that he has run roughshod over all of America's democratic institutions. And so Inauguration Day, as we traditionally define it, is always a point of departure. It sets the tone, it sets the vision for a new administration. It is designed to bring Americans together, which we won't have tomorrow. And you will have all seen, I think, really the moving pictures of the 20,000 uh, American flags on the mall representing all of us that can't be together as Americans celebrating this milestone in our democracy uh, at the birthplace, uh, frankly, um, of our modern democracy, not in Philadelphia, but uh, in Washington, DC. And so there's always a lot of symbolism in this act. There's a pathos as the Europeans would probably define it, but it's also uh, the beginning of a new era, I think in American politics. And I think it, this is no more true tomorrow than ever before, because we have experienced these dark days for American democracy over every single day of the last four years. Thank you. And what do you think will be the main themes of this new era? What will be the main themes of Joe Biden's inaugural address? What will be his main message, maybe? Even? He said in the past, uh, after his election, but also all through the campaign, that he wants to be America's president. And that is the similar vein of thought that we heard from Barack Obama. So in that sense, there is some continuity there between the administration he served first as a vice president and now an administration that he will steer together with Kamala Harris, again, the first African-American, Indian-American vice president in the history of the United States and the first female vice president of the United States. So I do think, you know, in as much as this will be a speech to try to bring America together to underline what unites and not divides us, um, it will map the challenges ahead. It will map some of the solutions that this president plans to install immediately on day one in office. There are many promises he made on the campaign trail, which I think through a combination of executive power and a shifting of some of the congressional majorities, uh, he can push right away. But above all, this will be a speech about vision. This will be a speech about hope. This will be a speech about the potential of American democracy. And I think it's worth spending a little time on this because America is poised to be the first truly multiracial, multi-ethnic, multinational, if you think about nations of origin and the United States as an immigration country, superpower in the world. And not, you know, in a, a far out time, in the next 20, 30 years. And I see this administration, even in its personnel composition, some of the leaders in the administration as real signifiers of how America is changing demographically, socially, and economically. And those were the factors that were frightening to the Trump supporters, that they tried with every part of their might, political, and as we saw on January 6th, physical to overturn over the last four years. And they haven't been successful. And that speaks to the resilience of American democracy, even though it was so painfully attacked from the inside over these last four years. And so I think this will be a message of forwards-based thinking, of visionary thinking, of hope, and of underlying the potential that rests deeply, I think, in American democracy. Wow, thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you so much for your assessment. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to all. Here's to a new four years ahead and a new era for transatlantic relations. So um, thank you so much to Laura and Catherine for setting further the stage. And now I'm very, very thrilled um, to introduce to you um, Terry, Terry Martin. Um, he is senior anchor at Deutsche Welle. And if there is one voice he here in Berlin um, who to turn to if you want to understand what's going on in the US and the transatlantic relationship, it's uh, certainly Terry. And I'm listening always to you religiously. So <laughs> it's, it's great that you are here today. Thank you so much for moderating our event. 
Uh, Stormy, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Uh, it, I don't think I really know everything that's going on right now in the United States uh, or uh, even here in, in Germany, but I'm doing my best all along to find out more. And I think that the people who are tu turn, turn, tuning in today are going to get a very good understanding of what is expected of the Biden presidency from uh, this side of the Atlantic and also some views from the United States as well. So thank you very much for those kind words. This is Inauguration Day in America. It's a very special day, always, when a new president is being sworn in uh, as the leader of the United States. But uh, today is, is important for a number of reasons that we've already talked about in some of the, the introductions. Today we're going to be hearing Joe Biden's inauguration speech, and it should give us some clues as to what his vision is for America and how he expects to engage with the rest of the world. It's being closely watched here in Europe, of course, by the Aspen Institute and uh, all of the organizations whose logos you see behind me, they're keenly interested in that. And you're going to be hearing from some of the representatives of those organizations in just a moment. We'll be following Joe Biden's speech live, and we're going to frame it with two discussions uh, involving about 12 different speakers. I'm going to open up the first one in just a moment, but these speakers should give us a very good understanding of their hopes, their fears, their expectations expectations of the Biden-Harris presidency and should, because of their spectrum of expertise, we should get a very well-rounded view. So without further ado, I'll introduce our panelists. We have just under an hour for this first panel, and then we'll cut over to the live feed of Joe Biden's speech. So first of all, I'm going to introduce seven panelists, so bear with me. There's quite a few introductions here, and then we're going to uh, enter into the question phase. Dut De Knut Detlefsen is the representative to the United States uh, and Canada for the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. That's the political think tank of Germany's Social Democratic Party, the SPD, and he joins us from Washington. Marcus Faba is a member of the European Parliament representing Bavaria's CSU party. While focusing on economic and monetary affairs in Parliament, he also serves as chair of the Hans Seidel Foundation. That's the party, the political think tank associated with uh, Germany's uh, CSU party in Bavaria. Bastian Hammerson is executive director of the North America office of the Heinrich Böll Foundation, the political think tank of Germany's Green Party. He too is based in the US capital. Michael Link is a member of the German Parliament, the Bundestag for the Free Democratic Party. He's the European Affairs spokesperson for the FDP's parliamentary group and serves on the board of his party's political think tank, the Friedrich Naumann Foundation. Uh, Dr. Marijke, uh, Marijke Olberg is a senior fellow with the Asia program of the German Marshall Fund of the United States and co-leader of the Stockholm China Forum. She recently co-authored a book called Hidden Hand, How the Communist Party of China is Reshaping the World. That's in German and in English. We also have Anahita Thomas. Uh, she's a trade lawyer and partner in the international trade practice Baker McKenzie. She heads up their international trade practice here in Germany. She's also a member of the board of the Atlantic Brücke, an association promoting German-American understanding going all the way back to the 1950s, I believe, that organization. And Dr. Micah Zwingenberger is executive director of the Bavarian Center for Transatlantic Relations. She directs a broad cultural and political program at America House Munich and is a consultant for multiple American studies programs here in Germany. Now, I mention these biographies in detail because I'm going to draw on different details of those biographies to give you an idea of what, we're, of what kind of picture we're getting of, of the Biden presidency, what sort of expectations in a very rounded way. And I'll begin with Knut Detlefsen, uh, the representative to the U.S. and Canada with Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. Now, Mr. Letlison, I presume you're with us. I think I can see you on a screen here just off to my, off to my right. You can wave if you see me, and I'll pick you out. On, on, there you are. Hello. Uh, good to see you all. Um, you know Washington well. You studied there. You served as a foreign policy advisor to Senator Dianne Feinstein, I understand. And you've, you've witnessed the last two years of the Trump presidency up close. One could say that you have your finger on the pulse of American democracy, so to speak. So let me begin by asking you, how healthy is American democracy as the 46th president takes office? Well, thank you, first of all, Terry, for, for 
asking me and also thank you for Aspen Institute for having me in this uh, conversation and having the Friedrich Ebert Foundation in this conversation. Of course, not only I think the democracy is in crisis, but the whole society is in crisis. And I would call the US as Joe Biden takes it over today, a nervous nation which has uh, undergone I mean, the most divisive presidency, the uh, terrible four years, which um, were pointed out in this uh, analysis by Kathleen Kluver Ashton. And of course, you, you can say that this democracy, well, is, is in dire straits and troubled waters. And um, the reason why Joe Biden got elected is because of his promise and the trust of the majority of the American people that he will do better and that things will get better. That doesn't mean that they will be all good, but they will get better and that they will be different, that he will restore, uh, as he said himself, uh, dignity in the White House and will bring back the soul of the, the nation. So, but obviously that is a very difficult task. It is aspirational and it will, to be done, I think, by very realistic and doable policies that will make a difference uh, to the people that feel somewhat disenfranchised or very much disenfranchised in this country. And so um, I would say, well, the, the, uh, there is a lot of opportunity and it's, it, it is a moment where it is now about us and not about uh, the narcissism of, of, of a person who, in at least in his final days, behaved like a tyrant and, uh, and uh, well, even in a way, uh, at least tried to stage a self-coup. And obviously, uh, the last 11 weeks between um, November 3rd and, and today, it feel very difficult to say the least. Uh, I would say they were troubling and in particular um, January 6th, I was on that day in front of the Capitol. Um, I mean, we're shocking. I mean, they were shocking, as shocking as 9-11, if you think about it. And, um, and um, it changes something. Okay. A nervous nation, Joe Biden is taking over there as president. Marcus Faber, you have a unique perspective uh, on our panel today, not so much because you represent Bavaria, uh, a political party that, that uh, exists really only in Bavaria, the regional sister party of Chancellor Merkel's CDU party, of course, but you, because you've been a member of the European Parliament for 20, over 25 years, if I'm, if I'm counting that up correctly, so you see America, at least in part, through a European lens. How would you describe the transatlantic relationship today, having observed it through that lens for so long, compared to, say, 5, 10, or 15 years ago today? <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. That is, of course, a difficult question, but I think that is the question. And this morning, I'm in Brussels at the moment, as we have a plenary session as uh, European Parliament, this morning, our commission president was in the plenary delivering a speech on what's happening today in the United States. And of course, a lot of enthusiasm is over there. And we should, of course, not overestimate uh, the new possibilities uh, or to come back to the old possibilities. But on the, on the other hand, we should not underestimate that at the moment, uh, this country is divided in a way I've never seen before. And I did not live uh, for a long time in the States uh, as a student, yes, but uh, uh, to, been very, very often regularly in the United States, having a lot of contacts. It's so divided as it was never before. So he has, firstly, not to act what's happening in the world. He has, firstly, to act what's happening in the United States. And then if you follow the agenda of uh, former uh, democratic presidents, I think there is a, a line visible and we should be aware of that, that the United States uh, started long time ago asking us in Europe to take over responsibility for our neighborhood and not always wait and ask uh, what the United States are doing. It was during the Clinton administration, it was of course during the Obama administration and uh, that has to be continued. 
uh, that we have to take care on our neighborhood as Europeans and get adult in uh, foreign affairs policies. On the other hand, and that was already mentioned by the State Minister of uh, Baden-Württemberg, uh, the question of, of, of climate, for example, how to save this planet will be fully different uh, than it was the last four years, but in a continuity, what we saw already on the Obama administration, though I hope that we can uh, come back to that. And, and honestly, the development that the United States are taking more and more interest on the Pacific area is not a new experience. And of course, uh, for economical reasons, um, the challenge coming from China will be on the top of the economical agenda of the new administration. Uh, and, 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 and Europe will not be the, the front runner in, in, the, in the interest. And even that is a development we saw or in a long line uh, over more than a decade. So therefore, I think uh, we will come back uh, to better relations. And I think we will come back to a good way of cooperation in a lot of areas. But the fundamental problems, which I tried to describe is only a few uh, uh, ideas, which have been established even long time ago, especially during Clinton and Obama administration, if I pick up the Democratic presidents, uh, will continue. And that, of course, will be the challenge for us in Europe, where we have to deliver answers and can't wait uh, till on the other side of the Atlantic, someone is giving us an answer on that. Mr. Palmer, thank you. Um, Bastian Hammerson. I want to bring you in now and uh, pick, ask you to pick up a little bit on something that we just heard regarding the nostalgia that exists in Europe for the Obama era, or at least for a time when transatlantic ties were not as strained as under Donald Trump. Now, you work in Washington with the think tank uh, connected with the Green Party, which many say has a good shot of becoming part of this next government in Germany. Uh, transatlantic affairs is your specialty. What are you expecting from the change of administration in Washington? Do you think that Joe Biden can reinvigorate transatlantic relations? Thank you very much, Terry. And uh, indeed, I, I do. And I think we'll uh, start to hear that in a speech, which will not just have a radically different tone, if I think back to four years ago, but also will be the beginning of a radically different presidency in substance. Um, Maybe just uh, let me give you three examples. You know, uh, I remember four years ago, Donald Trump focused on the message of I alone can fix it. And what we'll hear today, I'm sure, from Joe Biden will be instead the message we can do this together. Instead of diminishing the citizenry to an anonymous mass whose job it is to praise their leader, Joe Biden will empower citizens and view every citizen as a teammate in democracy. And this will be an important element of stabilizing democracy and also starting a, a transatlantic dialogue on how to stabilize and strengthen our democracies. Secondly, when Donald Trump's slogan was make America great again, I think Joe Biden's unofficial motto of his whole presidency is make America compassionate again. His presidency will focus on the disenfranchised and dealing with inequality at home and abroad because to make things better, and I think that's true on both sides of the Atlantic, to shape a more perfect union, we have to face the deficits um, of democracy today, from racism to poverty to unequal access to education. And thirdly, when the last years we heard about America first as a, you know, a principle in international politics, Joe Biden's theme will be America unites. His administration is guided and will be guided by a spirit of cooperation instead of confrontation. And for the EU, this uh, is truly a sea change. Uh, we are going to go from being the punching bag of the US administration to being the most important strategic partner. And that's a historic opportunity, especially if I think of the global challenges that are truly urgent and cannot wait another couple of years. Climate change, first and foremost, we cannot afford to waste another couple of years. And Biden and Harris have an ambitious plan that truly um, will uh, we'll be able to chart a good course on and tackle this challenge. Nuclear proliferation, digital governance, of course, the pandemic, there is, uh, there is a lot to do. So I think it's a historic opportunity. It really will be a sea change, and I'm very optimistic for the years ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, let's bring in Mikhail Link here now. Uh, he's a member of the German parliament, deeply involved in foreign policy and European affairs. Uh, you've been very active in multilateral organizations like the OSCE, a number of uh, multilateral organizations. I wanted to ask you 
specifically about that because we keep hearing about the we versus the I uh, coming that we expect to be coming from, from Joe Biden. D those multilateral institutions suffered greatly under Donald Trump. Do you think that Joe Biden is going to be able to pursue a revival of those multilateral institutions or are, has too much damage been done? Okay, thank you, Terry. That is certainly that is certainly one of the, the one of the most central questions we have to face right now, because indeed, uh, as you told, as you said it, uh, Donald Trump he was a president who was um, um, a challenge not only to the European Union but to the United Nations to 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 uh, and even to NATO. I mean, he was a lone decision maker. He did not consult with allies. Um, Joe Biden will be a president who will consult with allies. He will not agree with allies always. He will be, of course, a president which is who is who is really putting forward also U.S. interests, but in a spirit of partnership, and that is the key opportunity we have. Therefore, as the European Union, we should not think about uh, uh, now um, confronting our U.S. partners with an untimely debate on autonomy and and, and sovereignty. Um, we need, yes, we need to strengthen the EU. We need to be decision makers in the EU. But the more we are decision makers, the more we can be also partners on a level playing field with the US. And that is exactly what Joe Biden will expect from us. He wants to see the European Union as a decision maker on a level playing field with the US. And he will see us as a true partner and not as Donald Trump did it, somebody who always tried to split the European Union. And let me say on a very personal note, because I had the uh, privilege to uh, and the honor to serve as the chief observer for the electoral observation for the United States. Um, I was very glad to see that this, unlike a lot of people said in the EU, this is not at all a fair state, but it's a functional democracy um, and where the challenge from the very inside of the White House, of course, was um, countered by the judiciary, by the US Congress, and in the end also by the US voters. So I think we see a functioning democracy, democracy in the making. And even at 79 years old, you can be a very young president. That's what we see in Joe Biden. So I'm looking forward to a very true partner in Joe Biden and his administration, especially for us Europeans. Thank you, Mr. Link. Uh, you've touched on some issues that I'm sure that our next speaker is also going to be reflecting on. Uh, Marika Olberg, Dr. Olberg, you're an expert on China, the country dominating foreign policy debates uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. There's talk of, indeed, systemic rivalry with China, but the EU and the US have not exactly been coordinating policy when it comes to China, and Germany is partly responsible for that, it must be said. Do you think there will be more coordination on China policy between the European Union and the US, uh, particularly in light of the new investment agreement that was just uh, agreed between China and the EU? Thanks, Terry. Um Despite the investment agreement that the EU did at the last minute last year, I remain fairly optimistic that there will be more coordination between the United States and Europe on China policy. Um, on China policy from the United States, what we can expect is continued, you know, continued dedication to the the line that was started under Donald Trump, even though not the method. So ideally from the United States, we will be seeing a similar approach on China that will continue to push, push back against China. The difference is, of course, that now it becomes possible again for the United States and Europe to work together again, because um, that is one of the key aspects that the Biden administration or the people that are responsible for Asia policy and the Biden administration have, of course, pointed out as the big flaw in D Donald Trump's approach. <laughs> 
that there was no attempt at coordination. That doesn't mean that there's going to be, you know, the same policies on both sides, but we will, I am confident, see more coordination on the basics of policy, like tech policy, pushing back on human rights. Now, it's, it's unfortunate, and many in the United States pointed out that, you know, the, the, the European Union Commission pushing through the comprehensive agreement on investment with China. Obviously, China had a huge interest in pushing this through right before the Biden administration comes comes uh, is inaug- uh, com- comes into power simply because that was seen as as a good chance to push this in before there is a chance to coordinate that that was not ideal I, I think and obviously many on the US side have pointed that out I, I, I think there's a certain a certain willingness on the US side to push ahead on this cooperation anyway to say, okay, fine, you did this to, you know, come come up to the same level where the United States was with its phase one trade deal with China. Um, so as long as, you know, we're going to, we're willing to keep working with you and just say, this is your affair. We don't like it, but we're not going to get involved to try to push back. So I'm, I'm hopeful that there will still be many opportunities to work together, even though it's not going to be easy, it's not going to be a piece of cake. Um, but at least compared to the Trump administration, there will be some more willingness also on the European side to coordinate and work together. Not going to be a piece of cake. I, I think that's, uh, that sums that up pretty well. Uh, thank you very much for now. Um, Anahita Thomas, you're a trade lawyer uh, and a partner in the international law practice. Baker McKenzie, you head up uh, their international trade practice here in Germany. You're also um, you know, a member of the, of the board of the Atlantic Blocker. You, so you deal very much with what's going on in terms of, of trade between Europe and the United States, particularly Germany and the United States. Donald Trump had a huge impact on that trading relationship. Um, what can we reasonably expect to change with the Biden administration in terms of trade policy. Thank you very much, Terry. One could even say it can only get better. Uh, So trade policy has definitely been a very challenging one in the past four years from uh, being called a trade adversary in the European Union to punitive uh, uh, tariffs when it comes to steel and aluminium threats in relation to cars, EU cars. So we had a a full range of challenging um, uh, matters when it comes to trade. So I I look very optimistically into the Biden uh, four four years and maybe longer. Um, One point that will definitely has to be to raise is the WTO point, whether we will see the block, uh, blockage um, removed in that regard. But we are also hopeful that for once uh, and all, we will not uh, talk about punitive uh, tariffs on European cars any longer. Um, we will, of course, see domestic pressure when it comes to international supply chains. Um, President-elect Biden has uh, various times uh, talked about build back better. So we will see um, manufacturing coming back to the United States or or reshoring at least. When it comes to uh, trade relationships, of course, there is uh, talk and hopes in uh, relation to a TTIP 2.0. I would be a little bit um, skeptical at this point in time because the issues as Mr. Ferber noted in his um, note, have not been resolved. In, to the contrary, we have been seeing these issues already under Obama, and these uh, issues have escalated further. So I think we have to try to find new ways. For example, what we could do is to look at specific sectors. But if you look at TTIP as a whole, the issues around agriculture, um, foods, all these kind of issues are still on the table. So we have to be very diplomatic in our approach. Uh, but I think we should be ambitious nevertheless. Uh, just a TTIP 
um, 2.0, we have to be realistic. And we also have to look at ourselves too, because as you know, the political elite in Germany has not been pro uh, TTIP all the time either. So we have to look at ourselves and what we expect in, from this transatlantic relationship and what we are uh, able to do as a compromise. Um, overall, we will definitely not see executive orders, economic sanctions implemented overnight and treated instead of, you know, multilateral discussions, uh, close collaboration with the European Union. So this is, I think, um, from, a, from a politician with more than five decades of experience, I definitely uh, will uh, expect a, a much more smooth and collaborative future when it comes to trade policy. Smoother and more collaborative. Uh, I think a lot of people are looking for that actually on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, thank you for now. Uh, and finally, I'd like to bring in Dr. Uh, Micah Zwingenberger. Dr. Zwingenberger, you are devoted to cultivating cultural and, and academic ties between the US and Germany. How, tell us, how did the Trump presidency impact your work, your cause, if you will? And do you think that cultivating transatlantic ties, particularly among young people, will become easier under a President Biden? Or is the skepticism now so deep that the interest is beginning to fade? Wow, okay, thanks, Terry. Um, how much time do we have? Because that, that is a rather broad question that you asked, or a whole range of questions, I would say. Um, just quickly about the, the Trump administration time and um, German-American relations in the last four years, from my perspective. I think that on one side, I, I have to admit actually that during the, the Trump administration, we had a lot of interest and we had a lot of people participating in our events and um, debating um, very strongly all the, all the things that, that happened. So there was a lot of interest, but um, as you just mentioned, also skepticism grew over time, of course. And, on a practical level, it was really hard to work together because as an institution, you see that wonderful America House, we have a, a strong Bavarian presence here this afternoon with um, Mr. Faber and um, the Munich America House. But um, we, we used to work together very um, tight and efficiently with the U.S. Embassy and the U.S. Consulate and cultural programs. They help us bring over great exhibitions and um, also in the context of science, bring um, great scholars that we couldn't really um, afford usually. And that has been really hard over the last four years because we just couldn't agree on um, who we would invite, for example, to debate climate change issues and other important topics. Um, so I think that the, the broad Atlantic that is between our two nations has actually um, meant a, lo a lo long stretch and distance over the last four years. So in this sense, I'm really optimistic that it will be much easier to work together in the future with the Biden administration. And I'm also optimistic because um, we have seen some picks that Joe Biden suggested for his administration that I think um, are very promising. And um, I would just quickly like to focus on domestic politics again, because we, of course, we cover a lot of transatlantic issues in foreign policy contexts, like security issues, um, climate change, also trade issues. But um, I have to say that Germans uh, are also very interested in, in the situation for Americans, um, just in general, all over the country, in rural Michigan, in um, some areas where there had been a strong German immigration. And so uh, family ties are there or connections uh, via the military. Um, so with Susan Rice, for example, the pick for domestic policy council that Joe Biden has announced already, I think Susan Rice is a, a person, she is familiar to us from the Biden, uh, from the Barack Obama administration. Um, and she's a, a great pick to deal with uh, 
important issues, the domestic issues, but she's also a person that will bring some hope and emotions and some connections to, to Germans. So that is very promising. Another pick is, is Eric uh, Lander, who is going to be the science advisor. And this is also something new that Joe Biden suggested that he would need somebody advising um, his cabinet on, on scientific issues. So I see there um, there's a lot of issues that come up that are new somehow and advisors and the administration, I think, will be um, very interesting for Germans to see how these people, all the different voices, the new voices that appear, how they will influence uh, policies of um, Joe Biden administration. And, um, I think with those picks also comes a hope for reform. We talked a lot mm -hmm. that um, about the, the certain reform um, elements that the U.S. needs at the moment. But I think um, from a German perspective, people will really be concentrated on these reforms to see um, how well the U.S. democracy is actually functioning. And um, if that element, that moment of reform will be applied, then um, there's also hope from the German side, I would say. Okay, so the interest in the United States uh, remains. There, it has been sustained throughout the Trump uh, period in office, and you expect it to, to increase, perhaps, because of what is going on within Joe Biden's uh, administration. We have about 20 minutes left before I hand back over to Stormy. I'm hoping to uh, bring all of you in maybe one, once or twice, so I'm just going to ask you to try to keep your, uh, your replies brief if you can. I'm going to go back to the beginning of the panel uh, to Knut Detlefsen. Uh, in, uh, first of all, Knut Detlefsen, are you in Washington right now? I'm in Washington. I'm on the 15th Street in the office of the Friedrich Ebert Foundation, very close to the Capitol, uh, very close to the White House, a little bit further away from the Capitol. You've been there now for, for two years, but you've seen Washington in many s situations over the years when you studied at Georgetown and, and for over different, you've been there, I presume, many, many times. But I wanted to ask you for the mood. You mentioned nervous nation. What are you anticipating now that we have a new president coming into the White House today and the old president leaving without recognizing the result of the election and without congratulating his successor or meeting him on his way out? What does this say to you about what we can expect in terms of Joe Biden's efforts to revive the soul of the nation, as you said? Well, I expect that he will, I mean, basically he did this uh, through already his campaign, the way he conducted his campaign, uh, to, that it was a campaign that was very convincing because he always portrayed himself as the better president, as the president that, that is already trying through the way he speaks and through the basically the problems he discusses that he will be a president that really deals with the re re realities, with the problems that people face in their daily lives. And that is very, I think, the most important thing to do to, um, well, unite the nation if you want to. Of course, there's also limits to that. As, as, as Joe Biden himself said, it's not in a, a sky it's not just like a dream. It is something that has to be realistically done. And by the program that he basically, or the plan that he has laid out in the first 100 days, he tackles the most important problems that we, as people that are living here, are facing, which is the pandemic. I mean, we have reached the sobering number of 400,000 uh, people that have died because of COVID-19, the, the pandemic is due to the lack of attention by the previous uh, administration has gotten completely out of control. And I mean, the US and in particular people uh, that have lower incomes and are less privileged uh, have a very difficult economic time right now, you could say. I mean, they are really facing hardship mm. and many many people don't know how to end meet and that's why i think also his um the way he's trying to deal with the economic problems by extending um 
unemployment benefits, um, basically, at least that's the, the plan until September. And he will need, of course, uh, the support of the Congress, which he has, mm -hmm. but he, I hope that also at least part of the Republican Party will wake up and realize that they need to uh, prove that they can govern and that they can solve pro problems okay. and not only block um, important policy initiatives. And I think there is some hope uh, for that. And, and it's not just that is not just aspirational because you see also that there is probably a change by uh, of mind by some people that even people that have supported Donald Trump all along but realize that, that was maybe not the best idea that they've had. So there is a lot of opportunity mm. uh, and, and chance for uh, Joe Biden. But it is a very difficult moment. And very I must difficult. say the last few days in the city felt like the city is holding its breath. And today, I mean, I bike to the city. Uh, I do that every day also to check the mode, mood. It is very empty, you know. It <laughs> must be a frightening situation street. with 25,000 National, National Guard troops there. I can it's very hard to imagine what it must be like under such a tight security lockdown surrounding a, uh, an inauguration never seen before. It must be uh, a very, very uh, strange and perhaps disturbing sight. Marcus Faber, uh, you talked about the United States looking to Europe over the years and hoping that Europe would begin to take on some more responsibility for its own neighborhood. Uh, when Joe Biden, with Joe Biden coming into the office, um, those wishes, I think, will remain. You mentioned that. But how will, do you expect him to articulate that? And given what we heard today from the High Commissioner for Foreign Affairs for the European, uh, for the European Commission and, for, and from uh, Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission. She made some very welcoming remarks uh, towards Joe Biden today. What do you, uh, how, how do you see this unfolding? How do you see Europe and the US beginning to, to reconcile these differences that have been exacerbated over during the Trump administration? Yeah, I think that is a very, very important question, and thanks for that, Terry. Uh, as I'm in Brussels, and uh, I was witness uh, of the NATO summit, where really we saw that even NATO could have come to an end, uh, as, as, as Trump was really uh, squeezing the Europeans in an edge uh, where no one felt, felt very comfortable. Uh, um, I think uh, we will see, firstly, that, uh, of course, the uh, Biden administration is more favorable and more understanding how NATO functions and what are the European demands there. On the other hand, of course, uh, the 2% goal was not an invention by Mr. Trump or the Trump administration, and the uh, United States will come back on that uh, as well under the Biden administration, and that means as well take more responsibility. Um, that is the number one, uh, I think, um, Ms. Thomas has mentioned the, the trade issue, and, and I fully agree we should continue. Maybe a, 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 a TTIP minus <laughs> would be the best approach after mm. the lessons we learned. Uh, but we have uh, something more than we have now uh, negotiated with China. So we have something with China investment uh, uh, deal, which has to be ratified, but we have nothing with the United States. I think that is not uh, the way it should work. So therefore, we have uh, uh, to come back to those initiatives. So a TTIP minus, I think, would, would, would be the, the right approach. Okay. And, and, and certainly, of course, we have uh, to look to the other neighbor uh, of Europe, which is uh, on, on the eastern side, and that is Russia. And uh, as we have a lot of uh, things which are concerning me at the moment and us in Europe as well, uh, uh, therefore, we have to find a, a common ground with the United States how to deal with Russia in the years to come. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. Bastian Hermansen, by the way, we only have about, if, every, if I get everyone in, we're going to have about two minutes left for each of you. So uh, I'm please, please again ask you to be brief. Uh, you, you, going back to what you mentioned, the I versus the we, we can expect, uh, we can expect a more collaborative, uh, inclusive approach coming from the Biden administration uh, compared to Donald Trump. How, um, how open to accepting Joe Biden's offers do you think that Trump supporters will be? How, how 
difficult will it be to cross that ideological divide that has so deeply divided the nation? Well, I think uh, reconciliation always takes uh, two sides, right? Um, Joe Biden has made clear that his hand is outstretched um, for people that um, have different political views and opinions, people that didn't vote for him um, as long as they stand on the ground of the Constitution and um, are not anti-democratic. Um, but it takes two to tango and it takes someone to pick up that outstretched hand. And so I think the onus for true societal and political reconciliation in the United States falls a lot more on the Republican Party in particular. I think, uh, I think that, is, um, that is what will really decide whether, whether um, Biden can succeed and in the end where democracy goes in the United States. Um, and so we should not lose sight of that. Uh, Biden will do what he can, but it takes more than that. It is now up to the Republican Party to really decide and think where it wants to go post-Trump. Does it want to be an anti-democratic party or does it want to be with a small d, a democratic party that uh, believes in compromise again in cooperation and in American democracy. Thank you. Michael Link, uh, you talked a bit about e skepticism towards the United States that has, uh, has hardened here in, in Germany. You also said that, the, that, the, that Europe shouldn't burden the Biden administration with too much talk of strategic autonomy. Uh, I, I realize we're bouncing around between domestic and international affairs here, but from an international point of view, what can Europe, what can Germany offer to the Biden administration to help repair some of the damage that may have been done during the Trump administration? I think a good starting point for Germany, Terry, would be uh, that we uh, show the courage to reconsider such projects as normal Stream 2. I think, uh, independent of whether there will be a Nord Stream 2 in the end, the way how it has been done did do a lot of damage to the EU inside and also to transatlantic relations. Because whenever we deal with Russia or China, it is important to do it together as allies. In the EU, when we speak to Russia, we should first speak to Poland, to the Baltic states, and the Scandinavians. And when we deal with Russia, um, we should also first talk, of course to the US. And therefore, I'm not sure, I'm not totally convinced, Marcus, please excuse me, but I'm the, uh, we at the very end of uh, last year, I think, to think it was, it was uh, uh, really having a little trouble with your audio link, join. Mr. Uh, link. Uh, Sorry, um, I'm going to just move on. Perhaps, perhaps we'll be able to come back to you, but it's a little, a little tricky. Anyway, thank you very much for your, for your points. Um, quickly, Dr. Marika Oldbag, you mentioned that uh, about more coordination on, Ch on China policy between Europe and the United States. We just, with the outgoing uh, Trump administration, we heard his Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, uh, call what China is doing in its northwest province with the Uyghurs, an example of genocide. Uh, we're talking about crimes against humanity. The incoming uh, designated Secretary of State for Joe Biden uh, has also said he could imagine connecting with that idea. Do you think that on human rights, the EU and the US will take a common line regarding China? Um, it's certainly something that I'm hoping for. Again, it's not going to be easy. There is a lot of pushback for anything that is about holding our, own, for instance, our own companies to account on, for instance, being complicit in any of these human rights violations in China. Nonetheless, there has been quite a bit of interest in the European Union about focusing on human rights. In fact, if you look at some you know, public opinion surveys, you find that while Americans are mostly concerned about national security regarding China, Europeans are by and large more concerned about the human rights situation in China. Um, we've seen some initiative to start pushing through, um, to start looking at, you know, what, what are our supply chains? What are our, what, what do we have sufficient export controls? So I think even if there, there is obviously the United States and the European Union can't come up with common legislation, I think there is quite a bit of room for coordination, for looking at best practices, for consulting, 
um, between different parliaments, between the different governments. Mm. So I think this is definitely an area where I am hopeful that Europe will take advantage <clears throat> of this and will actually be on board with the United States on this because it's the right thing to do. Be very interesting to watch that. Um, Anahita Thomas, uh, you focus very much in your law practice on dealing with global investigations, also with the question of sanctions. Uh, during the Trump administration, sanctions have become a major issue in relation to Iran, and they've also been, uh, not to mention Russia, there's more, more uh, policy coordination there, but there's also talk about Nord Stream and what sort of sanctions uh, might be coming in association with that. Do you see a, r a relaxation coming in terms of sanctions in, in policy between the Biden administration and Europe and particularly Germany? So Vice President-elect uh, Harris has noted in her uh, debate with Pence that uh, they want to kind of have some kind of a back to the JCPOA, so the Iran nuclear deal. So I think that uh, this will be on, on President Biden's agenda. To whether we will call it and dub it JCPOA or whether we, give, we find a new name for it is a different question, of course. But I think uh, that this, some, this is something where, where President Biden will work on and build on what uh, President Obama has, has uh, achieved. Uh, when it comes to Nord Stream 2, I think uh, that is a very challenging uh, topic. Of course, we in the European Union are not happy about any kind of so-called secondary sanctions implemented by the United States. And we will continue through uh, all diplomatic means and sometimes by some kind of regulatory means like the EU blocking regulation uh, to counteract those. So that will be a very challenging road ahead when it comes to Nord Stream 2. When it comes to Russia, of course, I think the European Union uh, is kind of reluctant to, to observe what the United States is heading to. So I think uh, when it comes to Russia, the road ahead is, is much unclearer than when it comes to Iran and the stance from uh, the United States when it comes to Nord Stream 2. We're grateful to everyone who participated in this discussion today. Thank you all for joining us on this historic day, the inauguration day in the United States. I want to thank everyone who has tuned in so far and encourage you to do stay with us because I'm about to hand over to Stormy and we're going to hear, uh, of course, the inauguration address and then I'll be back with another interesting panel responding to that address uh, after Joe Biden has spoken. Thank you for now. Thank you so much, Terry. And that's the cue. We are going live, uh, CNN live stream, the inauguration, just a few minutes um, to go. And uh, stay tuned. And we'll continue. Thanks so much, Terry. Thank you. My fellow Americans, a moment we have all been waiting for. It is now my great privilege and high honor to be the first person to officially introduce the 46th President of the United States, Joseph R. Biden, Jr. <laughs> Chief Justice Roberts, Vice President Harris, <laughs> Speaker Pelosi, Leader Schumer, Leader McConnell, Vice President Pence, 
my uh, distinguished guests, my fellow Americans. This is America's day. This is democracy's day, a day of history and hope, of renewal and resolve. Through a crucible for the ages, America has been tested anew, and America has risen to the challenge. Today, we celebrate the triumph not of a candidate, but of a cause, the cause of democracy. The people, the will of the people, has been heard, and the will of the people has been heeded. We've learned again that democracy is precious, democracy is fragile. And at this hour, my friends, democracy has prevailed. So now, on this hallowed ground where just a few days ago, violence sought to shake the Capitol's very foundation, we come together as one nation, under God, indivisible, to carry out the peaceful transfer of power as we have for more than two centuries. As we look ahead in our uniquely American way, restless, bold, optimistic, and set our sights on the nation we know we can be and we must be. I thank my predecessors of both parties for their presence here today. I thank them from the bottom of my heart. And I know — and I know the resilience of our Constitution and the strength — the strength of our nation, as does President Carter, who I spoke with last night, who cannot be with us today, but whom we salute for his lifetime in service. I've just taken the sacred oath each of those patriots have taken, the oath first sworn by George Washington. But the American story depends not on any one of us, not on some of us, but on all of us on we, the people, who seek a more perfect union. This is a great nation. We are good people. And over the centuries, through storm and strife, in peace and in war, we've come so far. But we still have far to go. We'll press forward with speed and urgency, for we have much to do in this winter of peril and significant possibilities. Much to repair, much to restore, much to heal, much to build, and much to gain. Few people in our nation's history have been more challenged or found a time more challenging or difficult than the time we're in now. Once-in-a-century virus that silently stalks the country has taken as many lives in one year as America lost in all of World War II. Millions of jobs have been lost. Hundreds of thousands of businesses closed. A cry for racial justice some 400 years in the making moves us. The dream of justice for all will be deferred no longer. A cry for survival comes from planet itself a cry that can't be any more desperate or any more clear. And now, a rise of political extremism, white supremacy, domestic terrorism that we must confront and we will defeat. <laughs> to overcome these challenges, to restore the soul and secure the future of America requires so much more than words. It requires the most elusive of all things in a democracy, unity, unity. In another January, on New Year's Day in 1863, Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. When he put pen to paper, the President said, and I quote, if my name ever goes down into history, it'll be for this act, and my whole soul is in it. My whole soul is in it. Today, 
on this January day, my whole soul is in this, bringing America together, uniting our people, uniting our nation. And I ask every American to join me in this cause. Uniting to fight the foes we face, anger, resentment and hatred, extremism, lawlessness, violence, disease, joblessness and hopelessness. With unity, we can do great things, important things. We can right wrongs. We can put people to work in good jobs. We can teach our children in safe schools. We can overcome the deadly virus. We can reward, reward work and rebuild the middle class and make health care secure for all. We can deliver racial justice and we can make America once again the leading force for good in the world. I know speaking of unity can sound to some like a foolish fantasy these days. I know the forces that divide us are deep and they are real. But I also know they are not new. Our history has been a constant struggle between the American ideal that we're all are created equal and the harsh, ugly reality that racism, nativism, fear, demonization have long torn us apart. The battle is perennial, and victory is never assured. Through Civil War, the Great Depression, World War, 9-11, through struggle, sacrifice, and setbacks, our better angels have always prevailed. In each of these moments, enough of us, enough of us have come together to carry all of us forward. And we can do that now. History, faith, and reason show the way, the way of unity. We can see each other not as adversaries, but as neighbors. We can treat each other with dignity and respect. We can join forces, stop the shouting, and lower the temperature. For without unity, there is no peace, only bitterness and fury, no progress, only exhausting outrage, no nation, only a state of chaos. This is our historic moment of crisis and challenge, and unity is the path forward. And we must meet this moment as the United States of America. If we do that, I guarantee you we will not fail. We have never, ever, ever, ever failed in America when we've acted together. And so today, at this time, in this place, let's start afresh, all of us. Let's begin to listen to one another again hear one another, see one another, show respect to one another. Politics doesn't have to be a raging fire, destroying everything in its path. Every disagreement doesn't have to be a cause for total war. And we must reject the culture in which facts themselves are manipulated and even manufactured. My fellow Americans, we have to be different than this. America has to be better than this. And I believe America is so much better than this. Just look around. Here we stand in the shadow of the Capitol Dome, as was mentioned earlier, completed amid the Civil War, when the Union itself was literally hanging in the balance. Yet we endured. We prevailed. Here we stand, looking out in the Great Mall, where Dr. King spoke of his dream. Here we stand, where 108 years ago, at another inaugural, thousands of protesters tried to block brave women marching for the right to vote. And today, we mark the swearing in as the first woman in American history elected to national office, Vice President Kamala Harris. Don't tell me things can't change. Here we stand across the Potomac from Arlington Cemetery, where heroes who gave the last full measure of devotion rest in eternal peace. 
And here we stand, just days after a riotous mob thought they could use violence to silence the will of the people, to stop the work of our democracy, to drive us from this sacred ground. It did not happen. It will never happen. Not today, not tomorrow, not ever. Not ever. To all those who supported our campaign, I'm humbled by the faith you've placed in us. To all those who did not support us, let me say this. Hear me out as we move forward. Take a measure of me and my heart. If you still disagree, so be it. That's democracy. That's America. The right to dissent peaceably within the guardrails of our republic is perhaps this nation's greatest strength. Yet hear me clearly. Disagreement must not lead to disunion. And I pledge this to you. I will be a president for all Americans, all Americans. And I promise you, I will fight as hard for those who did not support me as for those who did. Many centuries ago, St. Augustine, a saint in my church, wrote that a people was a multitude defined by the common objects of their love. Defined by the common objects of their love. What are the common objects we as Americans love that define us as Americans? I think we know. Opportunity, security, liberty, dignity, respect, honor, and yes, the truth. Yeah. Recent weeks and months have taught us a painful lesson. There is truth and there are lies. Lies told for power and for profit. And each of us has a duty and a responsibility as citizens, as Americans, and especially as leaders, leaders who have pledged to honor our Constitution and protect our nation, to defend the truth and defeat the lies. Look, I understand that many of my fellow Americans view the future with fear and trepidation. I understand they worry about their jobs. I understand, like my dad, they lay in bed staring at, the, at night, staring at the ceiling, wondering, can I keep my health care? Can I pay my mortgage? Thinking about their families about what comes next. I promise you, I get it. But the answer is not to turn inward, to retreat into competing factions, distrusting those who don't look like, look like you, or worship the way you do, or don't get their news from the same sources you do. We must end this uncivil war that pits red against blue, rural versus urban. Or, or rural versus urban, conservative versus liberal. We can do this if we open our souls instead of hardening our hearts, if we show a little tolerance and humility, and if we're willing to stand in the other person's shoes, as my mom would say, just for a moment, stand in their shoes. Because here's the thing about life. There's no accounting for what fate will deal you. Some days, when you need a hand, there are other days when we're called to lend a hand. That's how it has to be. That's what we do for one another. And if we are this way, our country will be stronger, more prosperous, more ready for the future. And we can still disagree. My fellow Americans, in the work ahead of us, we're going to need each other. We need all our strength to, preserve, to persevere through this dark winter. We're entering what may be the toughest and deadliest period of the virus. We must set aside politics and finally face this pandemic as one nation. One nation. And I promise you this, 
As the Bible says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. We will get through this together, together. Look, folks, all my colleagues I serve with in the House and the Senate up here, we all understand the world is watching, watching all of us today. So here's my message to those beyond our borders. America has been tested, and we've come out stronger for it. We will repair our alliances and engage with the world once again, not to meet yesterday's challenges, but today's and tomorrow's challenges. And we'll lead not merely by the example of our power, but by the power of our example. We'll be a strong and trusted partner for peace, progress, and security. Look, you all know we've been th through so much in this nation. And in my first act as president, I'd like to ask you to join me in a moment of silent prayer. Remember all those who we lost in this past year to the pandemic, those 400,000 fellow Americans, moms, dads, husbands, wives, sons, daughters, friends, neighbors, and coworkers. We'll honor them by becoming the people and the nation we know we can and should be. So I ask you, let's say a silent prayer for those who've lost their lives and those left behind and for our country. Amen. Folks, this is a time of testing. We face an attack on our democracy and on truth, a raging virus, growing inequity, a sting of systemic racism, a climate in crisis, America's role in the world. Any one of these would be enough to challenge us in profound ways. But the fact is, we face them all at once presenting this nation with the, one of the gravest responsibilities we've had. Now we're going to be tested. Are we going to step up, all of us? It's time for boldness, for there's so much to do. And this is certain. I promise you, we will be judged, you and I, by how we resolve these cascading crises of our era. We will rise to the occasion, is the question. Will we master this rare and difficult hour? Will we meet our obligations and pass along a new and better world to our children? I believe we must. I'm sure you do as well. I believe we will. And when we do, we'll write the next great chapter in the history of the United States of America, the American story, a story that might sound something like a song that means a lot to me. It's called American Anthem. And there's one verse that stands out, at least for me, and it goes like this. The work and prayers of century have brought us to this day. What shall be our legacy? What will our children say? Let me know in my heart when my days are through. America, America, I gave my best to you. Let's add, let's us add our own work and prayers to the unfolding story of our great nation. If we do this, then when our days are through, our children and our children's children will say of us, they gave their best, they did their duty, they healed a broken land. My fellow Americans, I closed the day where I began with the sacred oath before God and all of you, I give you my word. I will always level with you. I will defend the Constitution. I'll defend our democracy. I'll defend America. And I'll give all, all of you, keep everything you, I do in your service, thinking not of power, but of possibilities, not of personal interest, but the public good. And together, we shall write an American story of hope, 
not fear, of unity, not division, of light, not darkness, a story of decency and dignity, love and healing, greatness and goodness. May this be the story that guides us, the story that inspires us, and the story that tells ages yet to come that we answered the call of history. We met the moment. Democracy and hope, truth and justice did not die on our watch but thrive. That America secured liberty at home and stood once again as a beacon to the world. That is what we owe our forebearers, one another, and generation to follow. So, with purpose and resolve, we turn to those tasks of our time, sustained by faith, driven by conviction, and devoted to one another and the country we love with all our hearts. May God bless America, and may God protect our troops. Thank you, America. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Garth Brooks to perform Amazing Grace. Shining as the sun, we no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. If I can ask you to sing this last verse with me, not just the people here, but the people at home, at work, as one, united. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch life. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see.
Welcome back to our inauguration event here at the uh, state representation Baden-Württemberg. Um, on in our um, event, Road to Election and uh, Beyond. I hope um, you had time to refresh a little, um, because now um, it's going to go high speed uh, through to some uh, further interviews and then to our second uh, panel discussion. Um, I had the opportunity yesterday um, to talk to uh, Suraya Sahadi Nelson, another really important transatlantic voice um, here in Berlin. Um, she is the former director um, at uh, KCRW Berlin, um, and she was a correspondent, foreign correspondent with NPR here in Berlin. And um, let us hear what she has to say about the uh, inauguration and what Biden is up to in the first uh, hours and days of his presidency together people from all 50 states all the territories and getting them mm, to sort of join together uh, in all of the challenges that, that need to be um, met we still have some technical problems um, with the uh, stream which sort of united feel I would but then we have say, to remember um, that we change, despite his um, best attempts there are sequence, still um, if that is all right um, because who I'm also um, already seeing um, is uh, John Emerson. John, it's so nice, to, so nice to see you. Where are you currently? Uh, currently in Los Angeles with uh, Kimberly and our girls, and um, it's somewhat of a bittersweet day for us because four years ago we watched the inauguration from the seats of our Lufthansa flight mm. leaving Berlin and returning to Los Angeles, and I'll tell you that difference in feeling in the Emerson family from that day to this day is profound. Oh, I am sure. Um, everybody who does, I mean, I'm almost sure that almost everybody knows you, but um, those few who don't know you, um, this is John Emerson. Um, he was a, I, I have to say, really beloved U.S. ambassador here in Berlin because you did so much for the transatlantic um, relationship and the transatlantic community. And now you're a very, very strong voice um, uh, within the transatlantic community. You are um, part and uh, part of many boards of transatlantic Atlantic institutions. So thank you so much um, being here today with you. When you watched the inaugural um, address right now, um, what were your feelings? I think my uh, profound feeling was uh, gratitude. Uh, I think we have the right man for this uh, challenging time in uh, not just our nation's history, but in global history. Mm -hmm. I thought the speech was extraordinary. Um, you know, it was honest and realistic, uh, but it was uh, it was compassionate and empathic, uh, uh, but it was also hopeful. And uh, I, I, I really could not imagine a better speech for the time. And then I, I'll tell you, I don't know if you all got to see this, but the poet laureate, the young 22, 23 year old woman who recited that poem at the end. I mean, that was just extraordinary and, and, and sort of everybody hit the right notes. And I will say that a huge cheer went up uh, from the entire Emerson family as we were sitting in our living room watching our friend Kamala Harris take the oath of office as the first woman, the first black, the first South Asian woman uh, or woman of South Asian descent to become vice president of the United States. That was a big moment for us too. Um it was a little bit of a, we would say, um, in German, Gänsehaut moment, wasn't it? Um, yeah. It was really thrilling, <laughs> thrilling moment. Was there anything in the speech which surprised you? You know, no, nothing surprised me because I, I, well, it didn't surprise me. I guess what surprised me was how uh, you don't, in, in inaugural addresses tend to be all aspirational and, and sort of uplifting. And this was sort of a, a, a leveling speech in the sense of being very realistic about the challenges that we face. Uh, today, I think you're going to see President Biden uh, sign a number of executive orders to try to address the four challenges we face. We have the global challenge on COVID. We have the challenge of rebuilding our economy uh, in the United States and globally. We have the challenge presented by climate change. And we have the challenge presented by racial inequality, you know, in this country. And he was just very straightforward about that. But what was 
uh, interesting was I'd say 75% of this speech was about unity, was about bringing us together, was about reaching out to those who didn't support him, for those who were perhaps skeptical and saying, you know, give me the opportunity, hear me out. And, uh, and, and I thought that was, it was just so honest. Uh, and, and I can't recall an inaugural address that had that kind of personal uh, leveling and honesty in it, which I thought was quite extraordinary. I think, um, didn't he also say that um, honesty is really an important thing we have to underline right now in his speech? Wasn't this one of his themes as well? No question about it. And, and you know, it goes to social media. It goes to the fact that we have, you know, all quote, alternative facts that the, the, the last four years have just been an extraordinary departure. As Barack Obama calls it, we face an epistemological uh, crisis here in America and uh, and probably globally. I'm sure we see some of that in Germany as well. And um, uh, and so for him to address that, in a forthright manner uh, in his speech, I think was uh, was quite powerful as well. You just mentioned that um, Biden is planning um, a firework of executive orders right in the beginning of the, I mean, in the first hours of his presidency. You know, when, when he did his speech, um, I thought, it's already over? It was so fast. I thought he would go into those policy areas and tell us, I'm going to do X, Y, that in the first hours, and then he didn't. Um, can, well, can you explain You know, why? an inaugural address is different from a State of the Union address. In a State of the Union address, which, which he will be doing, they won't call it State of the Union, but he will, I guarantee you within the first month, he'll have his first joint address to Congress. That's when you lay out the legislative agenda, the substantive agenda in quite detail, a quite amount of detail. Uh, but this is, uh, this is more of uh, almost spiritual in a sense, aspirational, uh, trying to encapsulate the moment and the hopes and fears of the nation and, and and show that show us all the way forward. And that's the purpose, I think, of an inaugural address. So that's why you didn't hear that. But I will tell you, the plan of the administration is over the next 10 days to roll out a series of announcements and executive orders. And today, he will start by rejoining the Paris Climate uh, Change Agreement and by eliminating the Muslim ba travel ban that, that was one of the first things that Trump imposed. So, uh, so you'll begin to see this play out over the course of the next 10 days for sure. And then I think um, we'll shortly have a speech to a joint session of Congress that will do what you were maybe thinking might happen in this speech, which is really lay out in great detail the substantive agenda that he'll be looking for legislatively uh, to both address COVID and, um, and get our economy back on track. So what he, what he is inheriting is a situation which is pretty dire. Um, a society which is deeply divided, uh, a COVID crisis which hasn't been handled really well, um, the economic recession. Um, he's got so much on his plate. Um, will he be able to do all this, um, especially since Congress is go also going to be busy with, with some other things going on right now? Yeah, well, I mean, the timing, obviously, the impeachment trial and everything that that President Biden needs to get done, including confirming his appointees to high uh, office, his cabinet members and all, not one of which has been confirmed by now. That's highly unusual, by the way. Uh, when uh, when I was in the Bill Clinton White House on day one, we we had literally, the on, on this day, his entire cabinet was sworn in. And uh, Barack Obama had something quite close to that, as did George H.W. Bush. So, uh, so that is unusual. And there's a lot to get done. But you know, the good news is that the, he is appointing an administration and a White House staff of people who have a lot of experience, who've been around the block, who know the jobs that they're going into. And so I think there'll be a tremendous capacity to hit the ground running. And um, I am hopeful that his outreach to uh, across the aisle, his historical, historically proven ability to work with people uh, in the Republican Party as well, will lead to some uh, joint bipartisan efforts legislatively to address these, uh, uh, these challenges that we have. So uh, can we get it done? Yeah. Will it take a lot of work? No question about it. 
uh, situation isn't exactly ideal, but um, we've got the right man for the job to bowl through it. Um, that, that sounds really good and very um, almost uh, optimistic and enthusiastic. Um, and it, it's so nice to hear this um, here over um, on that side of the Atlantic and in Berlin. You know how we are. I mean, we are, <laughs> we are structural pessimists, I would say. And you hear a lot, um, well, the tone is going to be different, um, but the style is going to be different, but not so much the policies, because the, con the restrictions are so big. Um, so we shouldn't get overexcited and um, be ready to be disappointed. What would you, s what would you tell Germans and also policymakers um, who say everything is going to stay the same? Well, I think uh, a couple of things. First of all, listen to what he said in his speech. He made very, very clear that he wants to restore America's relationship with its allies, uh, of which Germany is right at the top of the list. And uh, he wants to restore American leadership, not necessarily the way it was in the past, but American leadership in together trying to address or addressing uh, the, the huge problems that we face. And I was struck by uh, Tony Blinken, our, our good friend who is, um, uh, will soon be the Secretary of State, his uh, confirmation hearing yesterday, where he said, uh, he said, the uh, uh, United States of America will move forward with both confidence and humility. Mm. And humility and the recognition that we have a lot to do at home to rebuild trust abroad, and humility in the sense that these problems that we now face globally today no one nation, even a nation as big and strong as the United States, can handle them alone. Uh, they're problems that need us all to come together and to, uh, to address them. And I think that, uh, uh, of course, there are issues that we have that uh, aren't going to go away. There are challenges, different views, perhaps, on how to deal with Russia, different views on Nord Stream, different views on, uh, uh, you know, uh, perhaps even on, on burden sharing. But unlike the last four years where it appeared that that was the only thing that defined the transatlantic relationship, in the coming uh, administration, in the current administration, those will be issues, but the larger context by far will be all those things that we share in common. And, uh, and the tone will be very much reflective of that. So uh, I don't think things will stay the same. I think you'll see us reaching out quickly to work cl closely with our allies to jointly address uh, these massive problems that we face, starting with things like climate change, like uh, inequality in our uh, economies, uh, and like the need to, you know, in a, in a tougher sense, to deal with transnational terrorism and uh, nuclear proliferation and, and all those issues as well. Uh, so, uh, yeah, some of the issues remain, but I think it will be a dramatically different feel and approach and working relationship than what we've seen in the last four years. Well, thank you so much. We are re recording this, um, and whenever I hear um, a pessimistic statement again, I'm just going to play uh, John Emerson to, the, to them. Um, one last question. Um, remember those TTIP negotiation times when you were here? <laughs> I sure do. That was a lot of work and, and some frustration, I might add. And it was still a very positive project to work forward to, um, much more positive than the last four years. Um, if you were to identify the three top projects for the transatlantic relationship, what would they be? Well, I mean, I'm going to, we'll have to let, uh, you know, Tony Blinken and, uh, and President Biden, uh, you know, do that. But I would imagine, I, you know, you, you, you look at what uh, was said during the course of the campaign, I found it striking that uh, uh, that, that uh, incoming Secretary of State Blinken said it uh, in a speech to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce about two or three months ago, uh, probably now about three months ago during the campaign, that one of the first orders of business of a Biden administration would be to, quote, end the artificial trade wars with Europe. Mm. So I would think one order of business would be to try to figure out what we, where we want to head in that direction uh, and, uh, and to try to move forward uh, and, um, uh, and not get caught up in, you know, uh, threats about imposing, you know, massive tariffs on automobiles and that kind of thing, which is what we'd, what we'd seen. 
So that would be a part of it. I think clearly in the national security realm, uh, reinforcing uh, our commitment to NATO, uh, you know, uh, will be uh, uh, and our working together with our allies, uh, that will be a big piece of it. And then climate. In fact, climate may in fact be the first, as I mentioned earlier, it's the, the one of the first things that President Biden will do today is to rejoin the Paris Climate uh, Accord Agreement. Uh, that's probably the top area where you'll see uh, outreach to uh, our friends and allies across the Atlantic and, hey, let's get to work on this. Because even what we talked about in Paris is too little too late. We need to move forward in a much bigger way from that. So I think you'll see that as well. Thank you so much, John. One last question. When will we see you again in Berlin? <laughs> Well, I, you know, it's uh, it's tough. Kimberly and I have an apartment there, as you know, and uh, uh, we're both uh, looking forward to getting back. Uh, obviously, we're in this COVID time. Um, you know, Los Angeles and Berlin are probably in a pretty similar situation in terms of lockdown and all that. Uh, but I would I would hope we'd get out there this spring at. Uh, at worst, um, uh, we would love to be there for the Munich Security Conference, which I gather is now they're looking at, uh, at perhaps April, uh, late April timeframe for that. Wolfgang Ischinger will obviously make that decision. But um, uh, would love to uh, be back uh, by then, if not, uh, if not sooner. And uh, I guarantee you, you'll see both of us uh, over the course of the year. But thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, John, for Hopefully being Hopefully you can all come and visit us in Los oh, Angeles. Oh, cool. uh, we are on our way whenever this COVID crisis is over. Thank you so much for being here with us today um, virtually. Um, this was John Emerson. He was uh, the ambassador of the United States to Germany from 2013 to 2017. Thanks so much, John, for talking with us today. So we will do a second try <laughs> with our interview um, with uh, Soraya. Um, Technic team, are we ready to go? <laughs> Perfect. So, Soraya Sahadi Nelson is with us um, today. She is um, a journalist, a long term Berlin and German kenner, somebody who really knows German politics and the transatlantic relationship. And she is a former long-time Berlin correspondent for NPR. Thank you so much, Soraya, for joining us today. It's an honor to be here. Thank you, Stormy. Soraya, we wanted to talk to you, with you, um, about the inauguration. Well, his campaign has already, or I should say his administration at this point, has already announced that it would be America United. And he does have that really big challenge ahead of him of trying to bring, bring together the most divided United States we've seen uh, arguably since the Civil War. So it's, it's a very big challenge for him and everything he will be doing, all the themes, uh, it's a virtual program. Uh, and basically it's going to be bringing together people from all 50 states, all the territories, and getting them to sort of join together in all of the challenges that need to be met, uh, be it COVID, be it immigration, be it the economy, most importantly. And so it's, it's going to be, have that sort of united feel. But we have to remember that despite his best attempts, there are still tens of millions of Americans who just don't even agree that he should be president. And so the challenge is going to be a very stiff one for him to convince people to come together. Thank you so much for explaining this. Um, tomorrow is, is a usually a really important, I mean, it's also a very important today tomorrow, but it will look very differently from um, inaugurations in the past. Um, there will be no big parties, no big crowds, um, just a very different, um, different uh, st staged inauguration. And what do you think, how will it look like and what will be the most important uh, pictures the Biden team wants to project at this day tomorrow? Well, the Biden team will want to show him being sworn in, you know, to giving legitimacy to his presidency, which he very clearly won, but which again, tens of millions of people don't accept. Um, but we will also see the images of the high fences of the tens of, or I'm sorry, of the thousands of troops that are going to be on the streets, National Guardsmen in uniform, preparing for what uh, the FBI warns could be attacks. Uh, there will be counter demonstrations. So at the same time that we're going to see this very prestigious, very normal handing over of the guard, if you will, of, of uh, Joe Biden being sworn in, we're going to see this sort of warlike images 
that we are just not used to in the United States. So it, it is going to be a very daunting day, I think, for all concerned. And then he will start right away with policy making. Um, so we heard <laughs> a long list of executive orders, lots of things he wants to change. Um, what do you think will be his main things in the first days and first hundred days of his administration? I think on the first day alone, he's talking about rejoining the World Health Organization, about rescinding what's widely known as the Muslim ban to allow travel from Iran, Syria, and many other majority uh, Muslim countries back into the United States, of rolling out his 100 million vaccines in the first 100 day plan, of rejoining the Paris Accord, Uh, there are scores of regulations um, that he wants to rescind or, or that were rescinded, I should say, under President Trump that are now going to be put back in place, including oversight of financial institutions um, and, of course, his $1.9 trillion dollar relief package, uh, which still has to be discussed and voted on in Congress. But the focus there is to make sure that Americans stay afloat and that the full employment specter that, that existed in America before the pandemic, uh, that that returns. And it's, it's going to be very interesting to see how he manages all of these things. I mean, I, it sounds like many long nights. <laughs> many long nights, but you sound optimistic and you sound enthusiastic um, listening to you. So one important question, and I would like to end our interview with this, is do you believe that uh, President Joe Biden will be able to reunite to heal the country? I am less optimistic on that point, uh, to be honest with you. I think there are so many things that need to happen, but what I do think can help with that is if he has successes with all of his plans and if they are visible and felt by a majority of Americans quickly, then I think the healing will in fact begin. Well, thank you so much, Soraya. <laughs> This was thank Soraya you. Sahadi Nelson um, explaining to us what we should expect um, on Inauguration Day and the first 100 days. Thank you so much, Soraya. Um, talking thank to you. Us Talk soon. Take care, Stormy. <laughs> thank you. So we are back, um, and um, it's my pleasure again to hand over to Terry for our next discussion round. Thank you very much, Stormy. Uh, if you are just joining us now, by the way, we are in a, in a significant session dealing with Joe Biden's uh, inauguration today. We have had two, we have two panels. We had one before the inauguration. We're having another one after the panel, and that's about to start right now. We have five representatives of the transatlantic community that are joining us here at the state representation of Baden-Württemberg in uh, Berlin, joining us virtually, of course, uh, in this corona time. But we have now heard Joe Biden's speech, and we're going to respond to that, uh, what was said, what wasn't said, and uh, we will also hear from our speakers talking about their expectations, their hopes, their fears for the next four years for the United States and the prospects for renewing transatlantic bonds. So allow me to introduce our five guests without further ado. Daniel ben Benjamin is president of the American Academy in Berlin. He served as uh, ambassador at large and coordinator for counterterrorism at the U.S. State Department uh, from 2002 to 2012. He was on the staff of the National Security Council uh, several years and was a foreign policy speechwriter to President Bill Clinton. Uh, important experience for what we're talking about today. Martin Sebastian Abel is director of the public affairs consultancy MSL Germany and he's a board member of the Freundeskreis America, America House NRW, North Rhine-Westphalia. He uh, served a term in North Rhine-Westphalia's parliament where he was a Green Party speaker on budget and finance. We also have with us Nina Hasse, colleague of mine, head and TV editor-in-chief of the German public broadcaster ARD, uh, Capital City Studios here in Berlin. From 2012 to 2015, she was the ARD's bureau chief and chief correspondent in Washington, D.C. We also have Warren Marine, a uh, warm welcome to you, a treasurer of the American uh, Chamber, the treasurer of the American Chamber of Commerce in Germany and partner of the auditing and advisory firm KPMG Germany, where he heads the U.S. Capitals Group. Uh, Christian Schmidt is always, also with us, a great pleasure as always, a member of the German Parliament, the Bundestag, representing Bavaria's center-right CSU party. He's a former federal minister. Many of you may remember him from that post. He now serves on the Bundestag's Foreign Affairs Committee. He's also 
president of the German Atlantic Association. So first, a warm welcome to all of you for joining us. Um, we're going to first get your responses to Joe Biden's speech, and then we're going to get into the discussion as such. We have uh, about just over 50 minutes for this. So let's start with you, Daniel Benjamin. You were a speechwriter for a U.S. president yourself. What's uh, your impression of Joe Biden's speech? Uh, I, you know, I always expect uh, that speakers are going to bring their uh, their best game uh, on the on the day of an inauguration. But I have to say, I was really surprised and deeply impressed and deeply moved by uh, President Biden's speech. I thought it was outstanding. I thought it was outstanding because um, it was uh, Biden Bidenism uh, distilled. It was. Uh, you know, he is he he doesn't go for um, the kind of soaring rhetoric necessarily that a uh, Barack Obama went for. And yet his authenticity is is really kind of overwhelming. And um, he deployed that authenticity in a really effective way. Uh, it was a speech of restoration. It was a speech that reconnected the American uh, public, I think, with the American citizenry with uh, a whole host of an ideals, a vision of what America should be. Uh, it was a speech you could have imagined uh, perhaps Jimmy Stewart uh, giving in uh, one of his movies from the 30s or the 40s, uh, or Henry Fonda. It really, uh, the language was simple, it was direct. Um, I had a lot of fears about emphasizing uh, the theme of unity given what we have seen in uh, recent weeks and indeed the last four years, and yet he did it perfectly, um, establishing it uh, not in some phony way. In fact, what surprised me was how uh, direct he was about some of the threats we face, including, he said it explicitly, white supremacy and uh, domestic terrorism. Um, but, you know, he, he talked about collectives uh, and about unity all the time and about ideals. Um, you know, with unity, we could do great things, important things, right wrongs, put people to work in good jobs, teach our children in safe schools, overcome a deadly virus, deliver racial justice, and so on. So I thought it was, uh, as uh, John Emerson said, the right speech, the right man, the right time. And, uh, uh, and I was really, uh, you know, surprised and, again, deeply moved. Thank you. So we've uh, heard distilled, uh, talking about authenticity, uh, a Jimmy Stewart moment, as it were. Uh, so we've, all, we've got one take on it. Uh, I'd like to get the rest of you to weigh in as well. We're just going to go through uh, with the other four speakers. Martin Sebastian Abel, what struck you about Joe Biden's speech? Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, this was for sure one of these goosebump moments uh, when you're looking for opportunity, where can I sign to become an American? And um, all the presidents, despite the now former presidents, um, appeal to unity and uh, trying to unify Americans. Uh, Bush uh, 41 um, said he wanted a kinder America. Also, Bush 43 said he wanted to you know, change the tone in Washington. And of course, uh, Barack Obama, uh, the 44th president uh, with his famous, there is no liberal, no conservative um, America, but only the United States of America. And here's Joe Biden uh, referring to Abraham Lincoln, uh, who entered the presidency in the maybe most gravest history uh, of America. And um, this shows you um, how certain Joe Biden thinks um, uh, um, division in America is, and uh, unity was all over uh, the place was the motto. As a European, I also um, appreciated that he said uh, he um, there's so much to restore, and he pointed out um, the alliances. America is back as a leader, and um, I'm really looking forward to this as a transatlanticist um, that we can challenge the the great, great challenges we're all facing worldwide, not only the pandemic, but climate, um, security um, together with the United States. And um, yeah, I think America's back now. America is back. Okay, well, that's a statement. Uh, Tina Hassel, what was your impression? 
Yeah, I couldn't agree more uh, with my uh, with the two colleagues speaking um, before me. I think I was deeply, deeply fascinated by this speech because it was more, way more than just reaching across the aisle um, and trying to unify the country. It was, in my um, sense, a call for action as well and some kind of invitation um, for democracy. And for me, it was very strong as a European when President Biden was talking about time of testing and then uh, speaking about democracy, um, the pandemic uh, and all those big, big challenges um, that we join on both sides of the um, of the Atlantic. And so I think this was really a very strong speech and a very unusual. And I'm still I, I still have that goose um, bump moment. Goosebump moment. We've heard that, uh, I think, three times now today. Uh, it apparently did make quite an impression, Joe Biden's speech. Um, Warren Marine, uh, you have an interesting role on this panel. You've uh, lived and worked in Germany for over 20 years now, but you are an American from Texas, and you identify as Republican. How did Biden's speech resonate with you? Well, thank you, uh for that, and thanks for uh, very honored to be able to be on this panel today. Um, you mentioned that I identify as Republican. I would put that in the past tense. I identified as Republican um, prior to the uh, last four years, um, just to set the record straight. I, I have to agree with the other speakers. Uh, but I, I was moved by it. I thought it again. It was the right message at the right time. Um, it, it was aspirational. Uh, the issue of unity is clearly something that. I think most people understand is going to be very difficult, but it, it was the right aspirational message to put out there um, and, and to work towards. Uh, I thought it was perfect that he uh, made a specific uh, statement to the international community that's already been referred to by a couple of the other speakers, um, mentioning that we have been tested and we've come out stronger. And yet I, I believe he said we have come out stronger, not that we will come out stronger. So it, it was a very direct message um, and, and also that, that there's a clear uh, expectation that we're going to repair our alliances that have uh, gone into disrepair, unfortunately, in the last three or four years. So from that perspective, uh, it was right message, right time. Completely agree with that. He didn't say, other than that, too much uh, give too much specificity about what to expect from a uh, you know, business economic perspective, uh, mostly because he was focused uh, largely on the the most immediate threat, which is uh, the COVID pandemic. Uh, and, and I think he's absolutely right with that, that we have to address that first and foremost, and er everything else will fall into line after that if we do that right. The right message at the right time. Uh, Christian Schmidt, do you feel the same way? How, what were you listening for <coughs> in the speech, and uh, what did you hear or not hear? Thank you. <clears throat> I, I, I have, um, was very impressed. Because he make, made me in uh, some moments forgetting about uh, uh, his predecessor, about uh, Trump. And uh, maybe uh, beyond the situation that um, uh, seeing this very high uh, time of um, uh, the uh, American U.S. society uh, assembling or uh, gathering, rallying around the Congress, not having the outgoing president here, it uh, probably is the single time that this was right. And um, what we missed so much is uh, confidence and trust. And I got the idea and the impression that uh, this was uh, the real Joe Biden, with his um, commitment of values and with his um, um, not um, a tactical uh, approach, but the understanding that it's very important to go back to basic values, uh, and they are including a commitment of the United States on the international level, more than we have seen. So it's, um, I won't, do, know, do not know whether it's good to say this now, but there's a very simple German wording to say, do you trust anybody? Uh, would you buy a used car from him? Um, uh, so as simple it sounds, uh, but it gives the basis for confidence, um, and this is very, very necessary. That's the coin which uh, has to be paid in, in politics these days in this divided societies. And I assume that this was a kind of, uh, indeed, um, 
making, a, should I say, a new deal um, in understanding that this is a deal of um, respecting the other. If it will not uh, be the last um, decision or the presentation to be made, because I think there are some uh, challenges which cannot be answered only by the speech. But without the speech, I think the challenges can never be answered. So I think it's a good first step and uh, respect. This was not a politician. This was the president. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, all, to all of you for your for initial responses to the speech. Uh, I want to broaden the discussion out a bit now and have you reflect on the challenges that Joe Biden faces, uh, both domestically and internationally, and how those may be related. Uh, many say that Joe Biden is inheriting a country where democracy is broken, a country that whose social fabric has been torn, and that putting the country back together together again under these circumstances with a pandemic raging, with the economic impact of that, and with what many feel is, is widespread inequality and racial injustice in the country is going to hamper him in anything he does. Daniel Benjamin, you know Washington well. You know, you know the United States from both sides of the Atlantic. What's your impression of the challenges that Joe Biden faces trying to heal the nation, to restore the soul of the nation, as you said? You described his, his uh, speech as restorative. Do you think that's going to be possible? Joe Biden comes to office facing more challenges than any president, certainly since Franklin Roosevelt in the depth of the Depression in 1933, and possibly since Abraham Lincoln in 1861 when the Union was uh, falling apart. Uh, he does so um, with a bare majority in the Senate uh, and a decent uh, uh, majority in the House of Representatives and a deeply divided country. Uh, a lot will depend on uh, the uh, internal strife that is uh, taking hold in the Republican Party. Uh, a lot will depend on events and whether or not we face uh, a, um, a protracted experience with right wing, extreme right wing violence. Um, and some will depend on the international environment. I have to believe that they are going to go as hard as they can at uh, the pandemic and at um, the accompanying economic uh, crisis. They've already been sharing some of their plans for how they're going to do it. Um, the, um, you know, I think it's safe to say that uh, the pandemic is finally going to get the serious attention that it deserves uh, through the use of legal authorities and uh, and that have not been used before and really trying to get the vaccine out uh, to people and, and getting lots more medical workers into the field uh, to do what is necessary. Joe Biden is also an Atlanticist and an international relations person to the, his fingertips. So he's not gonna um, do all uh, domestic policy but he's gonna have a challenge on his hands finding the bandwidth to do what he wants to internationally. Um, I think that the uh, returning to the Paris Accords is very important, but also important, important in itself, but important symbolically because it represents uh, essentially a, a pledge to the international community that the United States is going to be a responsible stakeholder again. And the same is true for rejoining the World Health Organization, which uh, uh, the administration is also going to do on day one. So uh, enormous amount on the plate. Um, very difficult circumstances, uh, but a better start than, um, uh, you know, might have otherwise been the case, especially as we look at a Washington with 25,000 troops uh, uh, stationed there uh, to protect the inauguration. Indeed. Um, I do want to get into the foreign policy aspects uh, in a moment, but because Joe Biden is facing such a huge domestic challenge in uniting the nation, which was the key theme of, of his speech, it, it should be said, and dealing with the pandemic, of course, I want to ask uh, each of you, too, to maybe just reflect on that particular challenge, on 
on assuring that democracy is not endangered in the United States and trying to heal the nation. Uh, I'd like to ask you right away, Warren Marine, uh, I'm going to, if I see we've got somebody, got, uh, we've actually got Mr. Abel, Abel on the screen right now. There's Warren, great. Warren, how do you see what Joe Biden is trying to do in reaching out uh, to heal the nation, to those people who may feel disenfranchised, to support to Trump supporters who may still really believe that the election was stolen from them. Yeah, that's a very difficult question. I, I, I think that that is something that's quite frankly just going to take time, um, and and there are some that I I don't believe he'll ever be able to reach, uh, honestly speaking. And from, from my perspective, the best way to combat that is to execute on all the other things that have to be done um, and, and ensure that the economy uh, gets turned in the right direction, which I think will reap benefits for everybody in the society. Um, and, and I think a lot of the people on the, on the right, on the Republican side, uh, are really focused on their personal economic situation. Um, they've been told a lot uh, of things that, for the large part, are not true during the election, uh, that, you know, uh, electing uh, Biden as president was going to turn us into a socialist state in the U.S., et cetera, et cetera. And quite frankly, at this point, the only way to uh, combat all of that is to just prove that all to be wrong and to do the opposite. And, and I think a lot of the things that have been put forward are, are in going in the right direction, thinking in the right direction. Um, and we'll just have to wait and see whether or not the administration is uh, successful in executing on them. I think if they do, they'll really be able to uh, take a big step in the right direction in regards to that issue. Martin Sebastian Abel, I'm interested in your perspective as a, as a relatively young man in your you know, what are you, mid-30s uh, at this point? You've been involved in a number of exchange programs with the United States. You, you understand the, the culture of, the, the cultural exchange that's going on between Germany and the United States. Do you feel that there, in the younger generation in the United States, there might be a more willingness to accept the hand that Joe Biden is reaching out right now, also to the center-right? I'm sure hope so, Terry, uh, unless I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure if uh, he's going to be successful. There have been um, so much division, uh, not only in the past four years, but um, a long history of disinformation um, targeting especially um, more rural areas. Um, Joe Biden said in his inauguration speech, um, there is a big difference between the metropolitan cities and the more rural areas. Uh, I witnessed this um, in my first trip to Iowa. And um, I also witnessed that um, topics like uh, migration are um, seen very difficult in uh, smaller towns. Uh, we've been to a city in Iowa um, where the main languages in schools are uh, Spanish and also uh, police is looking for Spanish law enforcement. So um, I hope uh, that this will be the core to restore. And also, um, I agree with, uh, with Warren completely. Um, Joe Biden knows he has to deliver. Um, he pointed already out a 1.9 trillion um, restoring program, uh, bringing out uh, paychecks to every American over $1,000. And also, he will um, try to get a vaccine program running um, to fight the pandemic with 11 million Americans and unemployed. This is maybe one of the most pressuring uh, tasks uh, he's facing. Yeah. And I agree, um, when he delivers, uh, he can build on this and regain trust, um, he said, um, with his soul and heart. When you, you work for a public relations company, uh, crisis communications is part of your job. What would you say to the Biden administration? What, what advice would you give them at this point in trying to heal the nation? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I would say um, crisis is the ultimate point that defines maybe the whole presidency. And if he uh, will be successful in um, 
successful in tackling the COVID-19 crisis. 400,000 Americans uh, dead, 400,000 persons missing on the table. This is really um, something um, to build on and restore on. And um, also um, restoring and re reaching a hand, so to say, to those um, who didn't vote for him as he did in his inauguration speech is um, really the point um, to start. You, you, there is no switch you can turn um, that people will trust you. You have to build this and um, this needs time and this needs maybe the transfer, uh, transformal um, um, leadership he refers to with Abraham Lincoln. And um, history will show if it's um, successful. I, I surely hope so. Tina Hassel, you've spent time in Washington. You followed American politics closely. You've also, you're also a journalist. Uh, you're a colleague of mine. And perhaps like you, you felt attacked when Donald Trump described the media as the enemy, the enemy of the people. We're seeing a, a media landscape in the United States right now that is driving the polarization in the country to some degree. Do you see, how do you see that landscape evolving uh, over the coming, during the Biden presidency? And do you think that it's going, there are any hopes for reining that in and agreeing on a common set of facts, on a common reality, as it were? Well, I think that um, the common threat uh, and uh, the common challenges can bring um, the United States and Europe and 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 Germany, um, as I'm speaking for, uh, for as a German correspondent, bring them closer together. Because it's not just watching what the partner is uh, going through or being very relieved and optimistic today that. This, um, that the um, democracy uh, prevailed and that um, the um, institutions uh, showed uh, proof that they are strong. I think this common threat um, is something that can really be a kind of wake up call. And I can tell you and assure you that what happened in January 6th in, um, and, and, and at the, at the Capitol um, was really something that really shocked and shattered um, uh, German politicians, European politicians and public uh, at the same time, because they were all um, watching it like, wow, this is something, while everything we are we are we have very different conditions talking about media talking about politics but this is something this was an attack to democracy and institutions all over and it's about to make the west work and make the west be resilient so i i'm quite optimistic i can um feel and i do know that here in germany um there's a that was a wake up call and i think um here on this side of the atlantic it is really an understanding that we all, we Europeans really have to work very, um, very fast to make and do everything that the Biden administration can be successful, that we can all together prove in this competition of systems um, uh, that our multinational approach can be more effective than um, an American first or national approach and that I mean, um, our way of uh, institutions prove more resilient. And I think this is something which really everyone understood here that if uh, we're talking about transatlantic reconciliation, we will have to think it about um, as a two-way effort mm. and that we have to really act very strongly to not just take the hand, but really um, come and not come empty-handed and to, um, to offer something. And I think right. I'm quite optimistic on that side. Okay, uh, Christian Schmidt, uh, when you were listening to Joe Biden speak just then, and he, he referred to some of the divisions in the country, he talked about politics in general as well. And one could tra contrast what Joe Biden said with what with what Donald Trump said during his inauguration speech, where Trump talked about carnage in America and that he was going to end that. We heard Joe Biden say, politics doesn't have to be a raging fire destroying everything in its path. That's kind of the impression one gets of what's been happening in America the past four years. Do you see 
uh, do you see, what, what, how do you see the prospects for not making politics a raging fire in the United States in, over these coming years? Do you think that's going to be something Joe Biden can achieve? If anybody, I think uh, personalities like Joe Biden and Joe Biden personally could do. But what is it about? I think it's about reconciliation, not only of having this uh, split society, um, uh, which we just sometimes as Europeans are looking on as something very strange. On the other side, we would expect that um, this um, uh, healed society will be another kind of a European society. It will not be. And we have to realize on our side that the, 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 the tools to heal and to heal what um, uh, is uh, somehow very different and somehow very similar. What is similar? I think uh, basically um, we are living in a time um, where uh, we have um, a gap between globalization and, uh, and in all issues, uh, um, in not only media, uh, in technology, and, and in pandemics. And on the other side, um, we have a strong commitment of being local, regional, national. Uh, Trump used this uh, very simply with a blunt um, uh, approach and not healing, but not only not healing, but uh, uh, ensuring uh, the um, possibilities of the country. Biden has to try to reconcile globalization and those uh, following um, a liberal idea of the future world and um, combine it with um, a regional uh, understanding identity. I, this is similar to European understanding. And, uh, but I see that this is uh, it's a double reconciliation, which is very, very, very challenging, not only about um, uh, the regional, uh, the, the, the uh, greater um, uh, agglomerations and the uh, the, 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 the land, the belt, the rust belt, or um, the agriculture, but it is about to try to get an understanding how we could go forward um, uh, in this time of global, global challenges, not forgetting the climate change. So if uh, this is where we can draw some profit from Joe Biden's um, position and commitment, but we Europeans, we have to uh, learn that the second way to try to reconcile uh, the disunited America, uh, to take a word from Arthur Schlesinger. Um, uh, this is something um, uh, which is an American issue, and we have to see as a, a region where normally we say in a time of five years later, we're getting some of the um, uh, social situations uh, in our own society to see and to work um, um, not to uh, have such a split society where we are just starting uh, in our country to have already the first signs of such an uh, attitude as well. So it's challenging not only for Biden, but it's challenging as well. That's an important point uh, to make uh, about the idea that is very widespread in Germany that developments in the United States eventually end up uh, per penetrating German society as well. That's something I've heard a lot over the past 30 years that I've uh, been living in Germany myself. So I know that there was the people in in Germany and the rest of Europe too were looking aghast at some of the the polarization that they observed in the U.S. So I think we all agree that Joe Biden faces a tough task trying to heal the nation, trying to achieve the unity that he was so aspirational about in his speech today. I do want to talk specifically about some of the foreign policy challenges and how the transatlantic relationship might evolve uh, positively under Biden, what the potential is for that. And uh, I would go back to you, Dan Daniel Benjamin. Uh, we saw during the confirmation hearing yesterday for Joe Biden's uh, nominee, Anthony Blinken, for Secretary of State, we heard the ranking Democrat on the Senate uh, Foreign Relations Committee describing the, the world as being on fire. Uh, and we 
recognize that there are major foreign policy obstacles uh, that the Biden administration will be facing. Uh, do you, do you feel that there is the capacity within the Biden administration to repair some of the damage that has been done, that he talked about restoring America's place in the world? Uh, there, but there, that's one part of it, but there's also the practical part of putting the State Department back together in a way that allows it to function in accordance with, with Biden's wishes and to get, uh, get everyone on board to push for that. Do you think, how do you see the potential for that given the major domestic challenges that Biden has Will he have attention for that? Will he be able to get the mechanics right? Well, uh, a series of great questions. Um, and uh, what I'd like to do is first address the question about capacity and then maybe turn back a bit to what um, the previous speakers were talking about, the domestic challenge, uh, just very briefly. So um, uh, there's no question that the State Department needs to be rebuilt and, in fact, uh, an enormous amount of bureaucracy need, of our bureaucracy needs to be rebuilt because so many capable civil servants, foreign service officers, and the like, have left in the last few years, and we don't know the all the numbers yet, but the situation is quite uh, serious. Um, but um, the, on the plus side of things, uh, I shared an office with Tony Blinken for three years when we were both writing speeches for. Uh, Bill Clinton and Jake Sullivan is good friend, and I, I think that this is an extraordinary team that has been assembled, um, uh, possibly the strongest foreign policy team in many administrations. Uh, they're also strengthened by the fact that they have the complete confidence of the president. Um, this is not a team of rivals brought in from far outside uh, the Beltway or from many different uh, walks of life. These are people who've been working together closely, who share a vision, and uh, also who um, are very good at putting aside their egos and really can uh, uh, roll up their sleeves and get stuff done. So I'm quite optimistic about the team. Uh, the world is a difficult place. Um, you know, uh, we've talked a lot about climate as being uh, a huge issue. It is a huge issue uh, for Americans. Uh, comparably uh, uh, significant will be the issue of China and of building um, uh, an alliance of like-minded countries in dealing with China. So um, there are a, a lot of big issues. Uh, returning to the JCPOA, the Iranian uh, nuclear deal, uh, will be important. Ending the misery in Yemen uh, will be important. Um, you know, reassuring our allies, not only in Europe, but also in East Asia, uh, will be vitally important. Dealing with a global pandemic, ensuring that uh, vaccines are uh, distributed to countries that, um, you know, couldn't pay for uh, huge uh, shipments to begin with will also be a big deal. So there's a lot there. I just wanted to, I found the conversation before fascinating. I just wanted to say this. Um, America is divided into different um, uh, different informational universes now, different cognitive universes. And um, it is really going to be difficult uh, to break down those barriers between uh, the world in which uh, Fox viewers and uh, One American Network viewers are. And um, uh, those are the ones that um, are supporting the 145 congressmen who uh, voted to overturn the election. Um, this is going to be the challenge, uh, the challenge of the era. Uh, additionally, um, because it hasn't been said, uh, a lot of what motivated Trump voters was the fear of the browning of America and the demographic changes that are going on, and that is an enormous issue. And for Biden to create unity, he somehow has to convince those people that the pie is expanding and that they are getting benefits as well, and that uh, we really are uh, out of many one, e pluribus unum, because uh, that problem is uh, so elemental right now uh, that the uh, uh, there's no avoiding it, and that will be a big challenge for the new administration. We're talking about some of the, you know, there's a relationship, obviously, between domestic politics and international politics, but focusing, again, more specifically on, on the international dimension, Christian Schmidt, uh, you, you, you understand how these, how the relationship, the transatlantic relationship is being laid out. Uh, what potential do you see for Joe Biden to 
overcome some of the obstacles that are currently on the table with the transatlantic relationship, uh, be it regarding NATO, the whole question of security, be it trade uh, with China, uh, or even with Germany specifically, the, the North, North Stream uh, pipeline project. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, Joe Biden, I remember very well, um, was um, uh, as vice president, he announced uh, TTIP. And it should uh, launch some uh, closer cooperation in economic and uh, somehow political relations transatlantically. So I, we will not come back to this. But I think we have to try to make a new attempt um, uh, to um, uh, re. Um, organize our economic uh, cooperation, uh, especially looking uh, to the Chinese challenge. Um, so there is uh, some understanding, I think, that there's a possibility. I expect that he will as well work on the issue of relations to Russia. Russian Federation um, uh, has done a lot of things uh, which are not acceptable, including especially the Crimea issue. But I think the, um, uh, has, uh, we have had a, a lack of uh, back channels, a lack of uh, possibility of uh, just uh, um, a, a double approach, talking and um, being um, very committed. So I could imagine that this is one of the important issues um, uh, Biden, President Biden could do. And the second um, is uh, uh, indeed uh, to try to get uh, the security structure uh, of uh, NATO uh, re reformed. We have had now had this uh, commission uh, which has uh, presented its uh, proposals. It is now uh, on NATO to think about a new strategic approach. And it will be very important how far we see that there's responsibility of NATO uh, for um, responsibility, as uh, Richard Luger said in his times, um, go out, uh, NATO will go out of area or go out of business. It's not this out of area in the times of Richard Luger, but it's the need of understanding that there is a global security uh, responsibility, as uh, uh, President Biden has announced in this um, article in, I think, beginning of this year in Foreign Affairs, where he talked about the, this uh, idea of uh, the alliance of democracies. So uh, he includes values, mm -hmm. and uh, that's very complicated to have this in, uh, in Asia um, integrated. But uh, this should be the basis of cooperation. He will challenge us Europeans uh, in terms of commitment to NATO. And let me be open in my in my country. Uh, it is not that everybody um, beyond the idea that uh, Trump is off um, uh, is now committed to support um, uh, the success of transatlantic relations. I think we have to work inside. And this will be one of the, uh, the issues uh, in the electoral campaign this year. I'm very happy that uh, the European Union, um, uh, Jean-Michel um, and uh, Borrell, they have made some idea, gave some ideas and proposals of mm. getting a, a kind of new deal. Uh, I haven't said anything about, um, about uh, Nord Stream 2. Okay. Um, maybe we cool it down a little bit. Um, uh, it has not the strategic challenge um, uh, seen some in the U.S., but it's something that we have to talk about energy supply full, not only in this case, uh, uh, in future after um, oil peak time and uh, in the times of uh, renewable energy necessary for climate change. So that's another thing. Um, uh, I would not see that... Um, uh, Nord Stream is uh, indeed it's a strategic decision uh, uh, to have a transatlantic cooperation, yes or not. Okay. Uh, but it is a part. Martin uh, Sebastian Abel, you said in your first initial remarks that listening to Joe Biden's speech made you 
feel that you wanted to become an American, that uh, you would, you know, where can I sign up to become an American? So the, the vision that Joe Biden laid out in his inauguration speech you found very appealing. But during the presidency of, of Donald Trump, uh, opinion polls show that the opinion of the United States in Europe, and specifically in Germany, uh, has, has dropped to uh, negative points never seen before uh, since the Second World War. Do you think that, the, that other people in Europe will begin, will warm up to Joe Biden? Do you, do you think that they, that damage can be undone so quickly? I sure hope so. And um, that's also part of the mission of America House. Um, not only starting now, but um, in the past four years and beyond to um, strengthen the relationship, um, to create exchange, not only on uh, politics or, um, uh, you know, defense or uh, strategy um, formed foreign policy, but culture. And I think the cultural bounds uh, are very deep and um, there's a vivid um, exchange going on and um, I hope uh, we will overcome COVID to have some of the exchange possibilities, um, especially for younger people uh, back on um, part. I was part of many exchange programs and I benefited from it to see the US not only on the coast, but um, on, on the insides that's um, in the heartland, um, so to say. And I think Körber Stiftung um, recently um, did a, a representative poll and I think above 80% uh, says yes, uh, the relationship worsened um, for the uh, now former presidency, um, but will restore and um, it's our goal as a transatlantic um, community to, uh, to re-strengthen those ties and um, to exchange. And also, I'd like to add that I see many uh, possibilities where we can uh, work together as Europeans with the US. And one topic um, is for sure um, the challenge of climate change and climate mitigation. Um, with the Green Deal and the climate protection laws um, the European Union passed uh, in the very last year, we now have um, common goals against um, the goals of the Green Deal from Joe Biden are almost compatible to what the European Union um, formulated. Mm -hmm. And why not start um, a new era of climate diplo diplomacy? Also artificial intelligence. Um, we are Europeans, especially we Germans, um, we are very good in setting rules and frameworks. Why not work together um, on trustworthy AI and uh, bring something new to refresh our, um, our relationship, our, our friendship you, with you the United States? You just mentioned a very important word and that is trust. That is what has suffered so much in the transatlantic relationship. Uh, many are saying that given the, the transition from Obama to Trump, uh, that this was such a shock to the system for many on this side of the Atlantic that uh, it's going to be hard to restore trust because maybe Trump will come back in another four years or someone like him. Uh, there's a great deal of concern about that. Tina Hasse, uh, you've, again, you've been watching all of this. You understand the importance of, of soft power. You've been watching the relationship between the United States and, and Germany evolve very closely as a, as a, as a political correspondent uh, here in Berlin. How do you see that soft power relationship evolving moving forward? Uh, sure, there, there are issues like, like climate change where the cooperation may be possible, but do you think that that sort of trust can be restored? Yeah, I'm quite optimistic. I, I know that trust has been damaged. Uh, we have uh, several um, polls showing this, but I really agree um, that the cultural bond is very deep. And um, I mean, to be honest, nothing is so attractive than um, success. So I think we should 
of course, uh, cherish our common values, but should go ahead and not only talk about common values, but to prove that there is common actions and um, hopefully common uh, success as well. And I, I, um, I would not, um, or I would emphasize that um, climate change can be something like that, uh, some kind of EU transatlantic climate bridge, um, not only because it's a very huge challenge, but because it's uh, something really uh, moving young people um, here in Germany, um, then I think um, uh, talking about um, a kind of competition of systems is something that young people here um, is, um, they understand that we are in, that the different kind of systems are challenged. And so if we can prove that the Western system as a whole is successful and, and um, show this in starting trade deals uh, uh, talks again, really showing that uh, EU um, and Germany, including, is less naive uh, versus China. I think um, foreign policy um, here in Germany uh, towards uh, China is moving a lot, and we are not only talking about 5G, but that maybe we can find a, a common approach um, really Dealing with China can be something very concrete and something which can restore trust. And uh, of course, talking about the capability, capability of uh, defense. We talked about NATO. Um, right now, uh, here in Germany, it's a little bit different, difficult to only talk about the 2% goal. But if we put it more, and I think the Biden administration will do that, of talking less about the 2% goal, uh, and, and meaning about defense spending, but talking about capability and what we mm. can do as um, Europeans and as Germans for our own near neighborhood. I think as long as soon as this all can be concrete and successful in a way, it, we, we can restore trust quite easily because okay. right now we are talking about Navalny seeing about what's happening in Russia. We are talking less naive about China. So I think there is a lot of common common points, but um, to underline, unfortunately, time is short, uh, not mm. only because uh, Joe Biden doesn't have a lot of time to prove that, but because we are going into elections and, um, and after us, uh, we have elections this this year and next year it's uh, France having exactly. elections as yep. the two leading uh, countries. So I think it has to be concrete and successful um, and then we can, I am sure, re uh, restore trust quite um, quite quickly. You said it, uh, Tina, we don't have much time. Uh, indeed, we only have about five minutes left. So I'd like to invite each of you to just make a, a final remark about your expectations and hopes for the Biden administration. If you could put to formulate just one, two, maybe three very quick uh, re uh, ideas that you would put to the Biden administration for how the transatlantic relationship might be improved in during his presidency, uh, I would really appreciate that. Really, just uh, just a couple of sentences. Uh, starting, we'll start back at the top with Daniel Benjamin. Gosh, uh, tough one. So, um, uh, I think that uh, it would be one important to deliver on promises regarding climate because that confers a lot of legitimacy to uh, the European public. Um, and um, uh, to really uh, seek out a very wide-ranging dialogue on uh, China. And then the toughest part of all, I think, is to try to um, deal with concerns uh, of, along the lines you mentioned, which is that um, you know, if there was Trump before, there could be Trump again afterwards. And I think the biggest danger in the relationship right now is that Europeans will hedge. And uh, there's a poll out from the European Council on Foreign Relations that indicates very low trust in the United States and, and a deep desire to kind of stand to the side when it comes to China. So um, I think those are the, really the big uh, issues that need to be focused on. Very much so, that uh, European Council on Foreign Relations report. I think it began with the line, uh, Americans have chosen a new president, but not a new country, uh, which I thought was very insightful. Uh, Martin Sebastian Abel, uh, what would you put uh, on that list? 
Well, America first is gone. Uh, at least uh, it's not spoken out loudly anymore. So many uh, things that are um, important for both uh, Europe, Europe and the US will remain the same. And I hope uh, we Europeans are up for this and see the chances this new administration uh, brings for us. Uh, we talked about climate change and trustworthy AI. These are really good ways to start over and to reinforce the transatlantic partnership. Mm -hmm. And um, as I pointed out, um, also exchange is crucial. And uh, as soon as COVID uh, will overcome, which is also uh, maybe a good mission for Europe and the US, not only with uh, American European developed uh, vaccines, but also with um, holding our strengths together. Okay. Um, it would be really great to see um, the exchange going on and um, talking and, um, yeah. Okay, uh, talking is people. absolutely a good idea. We, we can certainly hope that there will be a lot more dialogue uh, across the Atlantic. Uh, Tina Hassel, very briefly, uh, what can be done? What are your top priorities for rebuilding the transatlantic relationship? Very briefly, uh, to prove from both sides that um, a joint approach and partnership is uh, working and is more successful than every country going by its own. And very briefly and concrete, uh, President Biden's first trip comes to Europe, uh, the G7, um, and that Europe and the US will then, and, and, and the G7 will already agree on a very concrete and specific new goal. Very good. Uh, Warren Marine, your priorities for rebuilding the transatlantic relationship? Uh, sorry, I think your mic might be off. Right. I, as I've said before, the number one priority uh, is to get control of the pandemic. Uh, once I think, one, I believe once we get that behind us, there's going to be no stopping uh, the economic rebound that occurs, uh, that will occur as a result. I think that view is shared by uh, many um, in the business world and the economic world. Uh, my view that him being um, elected is going to be very positive uh, on the transatlantic uh, rela business relationship it is shared by our members. We did a survey right after the election and 90% plus were of that view. And if we get it right with the pan, if, if the administration and the US is able to get it right dealing with the pandemic, um, there, there's not going to be any stopping the uh, economy, which has significant pent up demand. There's plenty of capital available in the market. Last year in 2000, we saw a doubling of the number of IPOs um, and had more IPOs last year in the US than in the 21 years before that. Um, and, and so there's a lot of money waiting to be invested and looking for the right investment. And if we get the transatlantic business relationship back on track, uh, some of that money will also flow uh, into Germany and Europe. Good business prospects there, it sounds like. And finally, uh, Christian Schmidt, a final word for you, uh, prospects for priorities rather for building the transatlantic relationship. Thank you. Priorities would be that we are working again to set the standards international globally. We've lost uh, the trace. Um, uh, Chinese standards, Asian standards are more than European and American. Can be uh, has to be restored um, in economic and uh, also on the level of values. And uh, the second, a little bit uh, European looking, um, uh, we are far off, but we have um, settled the situation uh, in in the, the eastern part of our continent and the relations there, including down to Turkey. So I uh, think with uh, jointly, we will be able uh, to set new, um, a new framework uh, for the peaceful development. Thank you so much. I want to thank all of you, all five of you, for uh, joining us today on this very important, this historic day, if I may say. And I'd like to just close by, first of all, thanking the Aspen Institute uh, for, uh, for having me here today and thanking all of the organizations whose logos you see uh, behind me. And I want to just leave you with a, a few quotes, just a few words from Joe Biden's speech that uh, have stuck in my mind. Just a number of words. These words are hope, resolve, democracy, un unity, dignity, respect, tolerance, and indeed humility. Thank you very much. Stormy.
Thank you so much. That was too fast to write it down, but um, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, <laughs> yeah, I need, I need that piece of paper. Um, thank you so much, Terry, for, for um, leading us through this day today. As always, we ask the right questions, um, which is perfect. I also want to thank um, the state representation um, of Baden-Württemberg again. Um, this has been an amazing day, um, and not just an amazing day. It was an amazing road to election and beyond. I also want to thank our partners again for not just being here today, but for, for traveling this road together with us. And to our audience out there who we can't unfortunately see, but we know and hope that you are there. Thank you so much for joining us. You know what? In these kind of virtual conferences and meetings, you never see how much work goes into it, how much excitement, how much fear if it's going to uh, turn out all right um, with the technical glitches. And you can see the team um, who takes such an effort in preparing this. And so this is the moment where I want to ask my um, ESPEN team to come up here with masks and with a safety distance just to, um, to say and send you off into the evening. Um, and this is them. This is, uh, we wouldn't be here without them. Thank you so much, team. And um, give our audience out there a big wave. And um, goodbye. See you soon.